Good Tuesday evening, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Bowling with the FEF, a platform for you to share your unique bowling story live on our YouTube channel. It is an exciting night, as those of you who have seen the promotion for this show know, uh, we have a terrific guest on tonight. He's a PBA Hall of Famer, a USBC Hall of Famer, and he's got a great story to tell, and we're going to have him on in uh, just a minute here. Uh, I want to start out by congratulating Clark Polzer uh, of the Twin Cities of Minnesota, who won Sunday's Midwest Senior Classic at Wagner's Lanes in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. If you've uh, been paying attention to the channel over the weekend, you know that we live streamed that whole event. And uh, Clark qualified as the top seed in the five player stepladder uh, and ended up defeating Craig Schiffler 214 to 203 to, uh, to win that title. Um, certainly an exciting day for him and uh, all of us who got to see it live. Here's what he had to say after that win. Been, what, three, three and a half years since I've won last, so it was nice to win. I feel bad, though, with Craig. Yeah. I mean, because he was in pain and no idea if I'd have won if he wasn't. I am a believer that our organization needs to be out of the cities more often than we are. Eau Claire, we usually have five to eight players from here that come down to the cities. So I am a believer we need to come up here. Maybe we can get seven to nine or seven to ten. So uh, he did mention there the pain that uh, that Craig was in during that match. Uh, he did have some back trouble, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Mr. Polzer is your champion for March of 2023. This was the first MSC at Wagner's in about seven years, and I do hope they come back again next year. Uh, the next MSC on the schedule is at Cedar Vale Lanes in Egan, Minnesota, and that happens on April 23rd. Well, if you follow the Facebook group, you already know this, but uh, I'm happy to announce that I'm also going to be live streaming uh, coming up later this year at an event in Rochester, Minnesota in December. The 2023 Holiday Match Games includes two tournaments, one of them an adult tournament, the other uh, run in partnership with the Minnesota Junior Bowlers Tour, so that's a junior event. They're both at Colonial Lanes uh, in Rochester, and entries open in November. Watch for details on the Facebook group and uh, the other platforms that I have in the months ahead, and my thanks to Al Houston uh, for a tremendous opportunity. Um, certainly looking forward to streaming that one, and I hope you are looking forward to watching it. Well, that's just one of uh, a number of events that we're going to have coming up on the channel. Uh, among those, uh, coming up April 14th through 16th, I'll be at the PBA World Series of Bowling at Bolero Wauwatosa. That'll be recorded content because Bowl TV is the exclusive live streaming outlet for that. And then on May 20th, the MJBT WYBT border battle at Wagner's Lanes in Eau Claire. And that will be a live stream. So certainly looking forward to uh, both of those events. And uh, like I said, hope you're looking forward to watching uh, some terrific live bowling action here on the Bowling with the FEF channel. Well, the Bowling with the FEF channel couldn't be uh, the way it was without support from our sponsor, Chip Magnet Salsa. And Chip Magnet has a great deal for you uh, coming up here. If you didn't see it already in the Facebook group, uh, here it is right there. We do have a promo code now, BWTF2023. If you go to chipmagnetsalsa.com, um, you can enter that promo code and you'll enjoy 20% off any website order of $30 or more. Uh, it is a limit of one uh, order per email address, uh, but it's a great opportunity to try out the best salsa you will ever taste. I'll go on record and say that. Uh, Chip Magnet, raise your snack standards. And thank you so much uh, to Chip Magnet for uh, providing that promo code and for sponsoring Bowling with the Feth. We always appreciate it. 
Well, our guest tonight is well known for his work on the lanes. It's landed him in both the PBA and USBC Halls of Fame. Although his road on the tour wasn't quite, didn't get started quite as early as he would have liked, and he didn't win as much as he says he could have, it was his destiny not only to become a champion, but to become famous. And uh, we're going to bring him out right now. We're calling this episode Dead Stroke uh, because that is a, uh, we'll say it's a condition that Ernie Schlegel of uh, Vancouver, Washington has experienced many times. And uh, Ernie, it is a pleasure to have you here on Bowling with the Feft tonight. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. Great. Really happy to have you here. And uh, I know you've got a lot to say. I want to get right into it. Um, of course, Jim, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chip Magnet says loves that Chip Magnet. Uh, yeah, uh, in more ways than one. Uh, he's benefited from that outfit. Uh, but uh, yeah, let, let's get started. Um, you have some ideas. You've told me you're an idea man, you're a salesman, you're a marketer. Um, and I want to get into kind of the history and sport versus game. Um, tell me what that means when you say sport or game. What are we talking about here? All right. In the history of the game, in 1958-59, there was uh, two organizations. There was the PBA, which had TV, and there was the National Bowling uh, League, okay? Mm -hmm. The PBA had, you know, Carter and Weber and 31 other guys, which were the charter members. And then you had the NBL, which had the arenas, and a very famous guy, Lamar Hunt, who owns the Kansas City Chiefs. And, uh, and and the rest of them. One of the things that, uh, that always bothered me is why they didn't merge, okay? Uh, because, and, and bowl at the arenas with the TV in the PBA. Uh, I don't know why, but that's the past, okay? I'm going to give you a little story, and that is there was the NFL, and, and their owners went up, uh, a rival came along, which was the AFL. Okay. And the AFL had lots of money and they had a guy named Joe Namath, my hero. I'm yeah. a Joe fan. And they paid him $400,000 and that, that everybody took notice. Okay. okay. Then they merged and that what the, now what do you have? You got the number one sport. Yeah. Okay. And, and when, it, and when then football ends, out comes base basketball and basketball comes alive. And then now we're in March and now March Madness is there. And then when March Madness ends, then you got baseball. And if you saw the ads on baseball, they're giving you all the new rules and regulations. So they're promoting and marketing their sport. Okay. And then, and baseball's for the, Opening days keep coming up pretty soon. And then after opening day, their sports marketing, the hype and the ec amount of it gives you the X amount of people that watch. OK, well, our sport is missing the missing this by not having all of the arenas that that has its own channel that people can watch from. We, we need that. We had a, a, a bowling channel a long time ago, and I don't know what made it go under. That, uh, uh, but it, it, if it stayed, you never know. Because, and one of the other things I checked on the internet, we're still the number one participating sport in the, in the United States. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that's about the sport. Okay. Yeah, if you wanted to know uh, an another thing that I also believe that, is hurting us is is why there is no unity okay, okay. Uh, how did the other sports do it okay uh, the more i re read and study this study about other sports is that uh, it, it's coming to me as clear as crystal ball but nobody wants to listen and it always bothered me until i read willie mace's book and in baseball they were always afraid the same thing. They were afraid to lose what they had. Yeah. Okay. Then along came this uh, guy named Kurt Flood, and he retired from the game. Imagine they're retiring at the top of your game and for a year, and, and he did it legally, signed the, 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 the retirement papers. Then he, oh, maybe I'm 
still got it. So he unretired and he broke the reserve clause. And now look what they're making. Okay. So, so when I start looking at that, uh, so I try to show you some of the stuff is that, is that, did you know when Joe DiMaggio had that 56 game hitting streak, but the Yankees didn't win the world series, they tried to lower his salary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's called fear or bullying from the power structure. Okay. And that's kind of what happened in, in, in bowling when we tried to do things about the power structure. So, well, geez, we'll get rid of you. We just get new stars. And I was there and I heard that strictly because they did it to Don Johnson. He was the one that was, and I, I heard that. So you must understand I was, uh, the, in, and that's what made everybody freeze. Okay. But you must understand I was one of the bowlers on the lower rung of, okay, players being paid. So I couldn't see if something didn't happen soon. I would have to leave the sport I love and believe was the toughest to be great at and to be able to sustain a living at. You know, I thought everything was gone when I keep hearing this thing. That's crazy. You know, did it happen in other sports? Maybe. I, I watched over the years – uh, uh, bowlers that were really good and loved the game and leave. Why? Well, because we don't have any unity. We don't have a union. Without a union, you've got no power. Without any power, uh, you're still going to make minuscule money. This is a multi, multi billion dollar industry. Okay. And everyone, oh, wow. No, how does he know? Well, you got to understand, I invent a finger grips. And I know how many finger grips I made. I was the highest paid player on the tour regardless. They, they didn't know that, mm -hmm. but I was because through the finger grips. And that was a little small t t ticket item. Mm -hmm. And uh, and some of my marketing ideas, uh, every uh, everybody's using now, okay? When I was with the grip company, you know, uh, I got to move this chair a little. I can't see. The, is, is that... They, uh, uh, I had, to, if you came on the tour and you were young, I introduced myself. I found out what size you are. And I gave you a bag, of, a bag of each size the next week. All right. And if you happen to get lucky and make the TV show, we didn't have an incentive early. And, right. And I asked what size you were. And the next thing you know, you had five new shirts. Okay. And with my logo on them. And then yeah. you put your name on it. After two years, everybody in the bowling center, not everybody, everybody that was using grips, okay, made show, had my shirt with my logo on. And after two years like that, next thing you know, if you were on a bowling ball staff, you had their shirt. My shirt disappeared. Okay. Yeah. So, but how did I keep it? it I had a monopoly. Because why... I had all the young kids mm -hmm. on my staff. So the other companies, I won't mention their name, had no chance. I put uh, Hex Grip, Orange Shade, the, 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 what's the, uh, the Bach Oval, the Pinkies. They couldn't sustain uh, on the tour. They couldn't make it. They weren't making enough money to keep pushing, okay, because they couldn't get a, a foot in the door. Sure. And uh, Turbo and Vice didn't get a real good foot until I retired. So my company just said that, you know, so. Uh, but bowlers still just don't understand it. If I'm if I'm selling this amount of grips, how many bowling balls are being sold? How many shoes? How many bags? How many towels? Uh, what are they called? The chamois and the. Uh, the uh, shoe slides and uh, wristbands. It's just, uh, and, and this is all over the world. Okay. And when I was pushing and promoting, there was only 5 billion people in the world. Now there's 8 billion people. Mm -hmm. And one of my buddies that, uh, that was, uh, that I was in business with, with Gemtech, he was, he was in uh, uh, China and he comes back and says, you know, there's a bowling center in every, the small bowling center in the hotel in China, all of them. I said, what do you mean? He says these little tiny, tiny, but I've never been to China, but he, hey, 
least that's what he said. So uh, they need a ball. They need pins. They need shoes. They need this. So uh, I don't believe that we are getting the uh, or the, the, the amount of money accorded for us because we, the bowlers, are the product, yep. not them. And for the longest time, I always keep hearing them, oh, bowlers don't sell bowling balls. And that's, that's a farce. When Earl Anthony used that, that ebonite orange pumpkin that I want to say was a bad ball, I don't know, because I never used it. But he, wanted, he made it look phenomenal. And then when he saw it, they sold a bunch of them. Okay. And there were a lot of balls that weren't really good. Okay, the power ball, Dick Weber won Kansas City using the power ball, but that wasn't really a power ball. It was a LT48 with the power ball logo on it. And that's when mm. the thing started to change. You can't do this. You can't alter the balls and stuff like that. All right. And there's so many things that things I wanted to uh, about. We have rules and regulations about softness and when the, you know like the soakers when the soakers came out in 73 that was a lot of friction okay yeah, yeah. and after the friction the they outlawed it because the bowlers would soak it and when they did that it made columbia who was zoomed to the top because they made legalized soakers that 5p yellow dot was an absolute phenomenal ball guys were trying to get them forever Mm-hmm. And 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 then all of a sudden out came the black angle in 1980 because I looked it up on the internet I wasn't sure of the dates uh, <laughs> uh, and phenomenal ball phenomenal ball and I don't know well Joe Barati and, and Jay Robinson came to me Ernie you got to get one of these I says why he says wow you should see it hook now here's two guys that couldn't hook a ball on sand like me and they're telling me the ball's hooking so <laughs> what makes it hook friction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But it still had a little weight block. Okay. We outlawed that 22 to zero on, on, on the executive board. Cause I was there. Okay. And, uh, we went to lunch and they came back and they changed it, which, is, uh, we couldn't really do, but Robert's rules of orders, but I don't know if we, that forum, our, our committee was, on Robert's rules of orders. If it was, then they broke the rules. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we 22 to seven, you know, them 22 guys were, they were all pro bowlers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Management changed that. We outlawed it, but every single one of them, except for me was on a ball staff. You understand? So the, that's what I meant about the bullying and the pushing and the stuff. Uh, should have never happened, but we did. Okay. But what you don't know, and I tried to say, if we had a union, that's what would have took us to the top. Well, we'll legalize it. A dollar a ball. Okay. Yeah. And, and, uh, oh, I'll give you another thing. In 1961 or 62, I wasn't even on the tour. Okay. Uh, this is a Ray Bluth on the executive board. Try to say, why don't we make our own ball? And they down, voted them down. Well, I guess because AMF and Brunswick and I don't know if Columbia or I, I never know. They, they were the, they were. I think they were the three main people that in 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 the early day, AMF, Brunswick, and Ebony. and yeah. they were sponsors. They were just sponsors, so they I guess they just didn't make their own ball. So if we made our own ball now, what would happen? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, to me, we have, mm, we got 10, 10 I, I believe right now, I, I, I one time I caught, counted them because I read the Bowlers Journal all the time and I counted all the thing and I got on the internet. There was 24, 25 bowling ball companies. Okay. But with product registration, there's only 11. Yep, yep. Okay. So that means the other 13, are registered okay sure, sure so and then i found out there's only 60 right now the to me i feel the pba is right where they're supposed to be 
Okay. Okay. All, uh, it's not an all exempt field, but uh, uh, the number one, they're product. Uh, they're for profit. They're not nonprofit. Okay. Uh, they're 64 guys. They're all pros. They bought one squad, which I found out. I thought, to, you know, okay. And that one squad, but, but, so now the conditions are fair. And that one said, I don't care what you do to the condition, everybody's bowling on the same condition. Whether it had oil, no oil, flooded oil, it's the same condition. Right. right. And that, that to me is fair in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the fairest way is like boxing or like tennis or, you know, head to head. So if this, if you only have 64 guys, what happens if you had 32 and 32 and you bowled each other four games, moving pairs, and if you go 2-2, two, two, the total would be the third point and that would be the winner. Because when I always tried to bring this up to other bowlers, and I won't mention their names, they said, no, nah, nah, but that's luck. What do you mean that's luck? If... What's this one? How? Oh, I had some here. I always want. I always wanted to know how good I was. Qualifying doesn't prove a thing, except that week you didn't have anything. <laughs> okay. So if if Walter and Earl and Voss and Duke and P. Weber and all these great great bowlers all bowled twenty years the way I believe bowling should have been, I would have ran into every single one of them many, many times. Right. Okay. So then you would have a winning percentage against each guy. Okay. An average percentage against each guy, like the baseball. Oh, yeah, I'm pitching against you, and, and your batting average is 125. You might have only met me twice. <laughs> okay, and, but in bowling in 20 years, you would have we would have run into each other many, many times. So then you would have that average. You'd have average winning percentage, uh, strike percentage. But the one thing when you get head to head, you'd have the one thing I always have, clutch percentage. Yeah. Okay, and many of the guys uh, in the tenth they weren't that good. You know, I consider myself one of the best that ever lived when it came to the 10th frame. Okay. And the only time I ever lost when it drove me nuts. Okay. But that's in the past. That's a guy. I, I don't want to talk about that past. My, or I don't even want to talk about my career. I want to talk about bowling because that's what my passion is. Sure. Okay. Many and and it's, it's interesting because, you know, that concept of head-to-head -head match play reminds me a lot of uh, what Nelson Burton Jr. said on an episode of the Bone and Zano Zone. Yeah. He said, you know, I don't care what your average is. I don't care about your honor scores. I care about who you've beaten and if, sure. you know, if I know that. Okay. Uh, Burton and I, we, we were Goombas and we were on the tour and we challenged any two bowlers. And we made a, quite a few people. We bowled not too many magic. They weren't. They wouldn't bowl us. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, because in, in the tenth frame, he's tough. And who did I beat for my first title? Him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But people, you remember I always told you about destiny. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that uh, my first title was against him, but it was destiny that I beat him. He was sitting to the right of me with three games to go. He was 250 pins off the show. And he's sitting to me, and it's, it's the sixth frame. And he said, man, I really look. And I'm already on the show, okay? Mm -hmm. And he said, man, I've, I just found that everything looks pretty good. This And he got his rhythm and his flow. And I leaned back a little like this, and I looked down, and I says, Bobo, Wayne Webb shooting, looks like he's shooting 150. If you punch this game out, you shoot 250, and boom. And he struck it out for 250. Wayne Webb shot 150. Next game, he bowled Wayne Webb, and he beat him. And then that, now it's in the position round. He bowled Wayne Webb, and he beat him. He made the show. Okay. And then he ran the table, 
And who did he run into? <laughs> you. So, that's destiny. That's destiny because uh, would he have still made the show if I didn't say what I did? I look everywhere. I'm oh, I'm very aware of what's going on around me. Sure. If I'm bowling bad, I'm looking at the guys to the left and the right of me. And, you know, when they come around with the board, what the cash figure is, what the finals figure, if you're to the left of me or right of me and, and you're close and I'm out of it, I'm stay back. I'll stay back. I'll be quiet. Yeah. Why? Because it's a sportsmanship. Okay. Uh, uh, some of the guys just never understood that. And I won't mention them, somebody's name, but uh, I remember one time in a tournament, uh, I went 258, 268 to make the finals, and the guy that left me, I wanted to strangle him. Because, <laughs> he, well, he was out of, out of it, and he was doing things, look at me, look at me, and I'm trying to make the finals. No, that's not, that, that's bad sportsmanship. That should, should never happen. Okay, and that's the other reason I believe head to head. Head to head, uh, you could come back tomorrow. I don't care. Sure. Okay, uh, you know, there's no way you could break my rhythm. There's no way that uh, you could do anything. In qualifying, everybody wants to go at their pace, okay, and their rhythm. And you're fighting for score. So when I'm in my rhythm, and I'm, I'm, and my flow, they would drive me nuts because I was bowling slow. No, uh, uh, they were doing that on purpose. And anybody that doesn't think that doesn't know how to bowl, mm -hmm. okay? Because it never bothered me when I was 200 under, and that didn't happen too often. But when I was out of it and then 20 under and and 150 overs cash or 200 overs cash and stuff, they never bothered. Oh, was I bowling slow then? No. I was, well, you got to understand, I go at the same rhythm and pace, whether it's just me by myself, two, three, four, five, it's the same. It has to be. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's like a metronome in your, in your mind. So just to get people to understand why I bowled the way I did. Okay. Yeah. Because you're trying to get the rhythm and the flow. The guys, will, when they're bowling bad, they jittery and edgy because you're going because they're scored they want to go faster okay um, but when they're balling good everybody's slow yeah ever seen anybody on eight in a row and eight in a row and nine in a row every time he gets a strike he gets slower and slower and slower and 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 and, and, and okay if you don't know that then you don't know how to bowl everybody gets slow yeah. okay because you're trying to get focused <sighs> Got to get that any that air out because your your heart's starting to pump, okay. Yeah. And how so, do I know? I, yeah, I went three hundred one fifty five. <laughs> I went three hundred one forty eight. Why you shoot three hundred? And your heart's going like crazy, and, and 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 you can't get it, and you can't, and that's on the same pair. <laughs> yeah. And I, what do you think I shot the next game? Two sixty eight both times. <laughs> so. Uh, are uh, you froze again? Can you hear me? Uh oh. Fef. No. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, you you froze again a little bit. Good. Yeah, uh, you froze again. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me, Fef? You still there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. You're frozen. Yep. All right. I, I switched up the connection. Hopefully that helps. So I, I got a comment in uh, from one of our live viewers, and uh, he he asks, and, and this is something I was going to bring up a little later, but as you know, uh, nobody <coughs> can wait when it comes to you and Randy Peterson. Uh, he, he wants to know, does Randy Peterson really still hold a grudge against Ernie for the Stone 8 celebration? And uh, I have I can answer that right now uh, because and you've got notes. Um, but uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, there was a podcast called uh, the Spare Time Bowling Show, 
and they had Randy on. And one of the hosts asked Randy about his um, his Twitter handle. His Twitter handle is Stone8RP. And if you've watched any of the PBA Tour shows, you know when somebody leaves an 8-pin, they always talk about it. So he said, why is it Stone8RP? And he kind of paused for a second, and he said, I'm mostly remembered for leaving a solid 8 against that mm hole And he didn't censor himself. So, I mean, that kind of tells you okay. where he stands. All right, uh, let me uh, let me get, get let's, to the, let's let's yeah, talk I'm about gonna get to the point. Yeah, let's talk about your point and, of view on that. I'm still waiting for my handshake, which the loser congratulates the winner, no matter what. The thrill of victory and the agony of defeat is what the, made ABC Sports, Wild World of Sports, great. Okay. It's the mainstay of sport. Where, where, where in March Madness, and when there is a buzzer beater, the winner goes crazy, which I did, mm-hmm. and the loser bows their head in defeat, and then congratulates the winner. That's how sportsmanship works. That's class in defeat. Okay, Mm -hmm. I should know it happened a lot, but more so to Earl and Walter. So what did they do when they lost? They went up to the guy that won and shook his hand. And Dennis, when their great match like Nadal against Djokovic, that five hour and 59 minute Thing and Djokovic beat him. I guarantee he wanted to take that. They they went to the net, they hugged, and he gave him, shook his hand. And that's class in defeat. Your class in defeat was not any good. My jubilation of winning was like March Madness, the buzzer beater. So maybe you should look in the mirror and then you'd know what what it is. Do you think you'll ever carry my bag? Do do you think you'll ever get that handshake? No. No. Because you know, when you don't have any class and you don't know what losing is and what winning is, you know, you gotta understand that if I bowled more games and more matches in action than anybody in the history of the game. I bowl seven days a week. I went into a bowling center and I challenged the house. And whoever was there, I beat them. I beat all of them. Okay. And, and that was in the East. Okay. When I was 19 years old and 20 years old, you must understand. And then the PBA barred me from the tour for five years. Now, you must understand that I threw a full roller. And a full roller's ball rolls right between the fingers and the thumb. All right. And in, when I was 20, what year was that? 1963. Who was bowler of the year in 1963? Billy Harvard. What did he throw? A full roller. Oh. I'm not saying I was better than him or this or that. It's just that if I bowled in 63, I tried to join the PBA in 63, but I had to go through Frank Esposito. And we had a very big disagreement when, we, when I was 19. He threw me out of his bowling center. And I didn't do anything. And I went berserk. And I told him, you know, I told him where he could go. He was throwing me, firing me from my job. I used to make an awful lot of money in the parameters. You know, there was $5 pot games from 1130 at night to 3 in the morning. But a quarter to 3 in the morning was jackpot. And usually jackpot, the first price was about three four $400, which was a lot of money. Plus, I was betting almost 80 90% of the guys in, in, in the uh, – in the pocket, you see this yellow pad? Well, yeah, I had everybody's name in it that was in that pocket. You want to bet? You want to bet? You want to bet? You want to bet? Yeah. There you are. Oh, <laughs> I, wasn't I, I wasn't afraid of anybody. My ego yeah. is, uh, is larger than most people's because I could do things, more things with a ball and ball than most people could. Okay. 
I had when I was a hustler. You got to understand. I could bowl one fifty nine right on the nose. You got to hit a pin every time. I could bowl one thirty nine on the nose. Hit a pin every single time. I could shoot. Uh, I bowl even today. I will bowl any one of the guys today at my age low score because I still practice it all the time. Because I'm still pretty good. I still can shoot under fifty. Okay. And those are the things. That's control of the round ball. Okay. Uh, and, and some of the times, like, they have all these games. Well, why don't you? Walter Ray, I would give my left arm just to bowl him low score. Ooh, because he is, you know, hey, he was six-time uh, the world horseshoe pitching champion, and he's pretty accurate. Boy, I would love. But you got to pick the 10 off on the right side. Mm-hmm. In the left side of the seven pin. Otherwise, you hit. And when you play low score, uh, I used to also play a game called head pin. It start from the right gutter and just throw it at the head pin. You just keep moving till you're all the way on the other side. And the reason you did that to see how the pins fell. Yeah. Okay. And then I used to play play a, a, a game where you used to set up the four six and you try to go through the middle of it twenty times. And you think that's easy? <laughs> Why is that? You may you lose the ball one time off your hand, or you or you miss it at the bottom. Just it's pretty hard to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I could chop. I could chop the six off the ten. Yeah. I would bet you on it. I could. <laughs> uh, I would bet you on uh, that. I could make the five seven. Well, I left it a lot, but the five seven to me was a fairly easy spare because yeah. I, I bowl strictly by mathematics and. And what I mean about it is you have to know how many revolutions you th- throw to make that spare. Okay. Some guys, yeah, I, I know exactly how many board I move one zero to make the five, seven. If the lane's hooking, it's two zero. Okay. I can leave a washout. I can leave the two for five. I can leave the bucket. I can leave everything. So when you're a hustler and you're bowling somebody, Okay. You don't want to beat him to death. Otherwise, right. you, you can't make any money. He quits, and he may not come back the next week. You so want him to think he's got a chance the next time. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, the, I spent the whole summer in, in Asbury Park bowling off the wrong foot, and it was the ugliest thing you ever wanted to see. But I made an awful lot of money. I spent the whole summer there at the pay- my girlfriend and her son had a great time there and I had to pay for the motel, the food and everything. I still went home with a whole bunch of money. <laughs> uh, and I, uh, uh, Brian Voss, I don't think if he still remembers him, uh, there was a thousand dollar bonus and I bowled him and I bowled him off the wrong foot. He bowled left hand and we bowled it to match and he never had a chance. Yeah. Yeah. I could bowl just as good wrong foot as I can right foot because I understand the the manipulation of of, of where you're supposed to stand. Okay, uh, you, you talked about you know some of the the action and you know you're famous for your success in action matches. Tell me about you know about that about you know the skill that you acquire from doing that enough because we don't have you know anything like these action matches that you had in new york well, no I mean, but it, 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 the population you got you have to understand it was a uh, bowling exploded and i mean exploded in the in in, the, in the new york city new york new york uh it has five boroughs i mean five boroughs they were packed there was action everywhere and there was action in Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island. <laughs> and I went to all of the places. So, and if they didn't know who you were, whoo, I went up to uh, Rome, New York. Okay. And we went up there and it was in, the, in November. And I'll never forget it. Yeah, you know, I bought this potato farmer. And, and we went there. And, and well, when we first we went up there, we bowled in this place called Boonville Bowl, all right? And it was in the blizzard, yeah, okay? <laughs> and we went in there, and my buddy Stevie, he he was bowling, and I was sitting in, 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 in the, they had little tiny bleachers, and I was sitting in the bleachers having a cup of coffee, and these two guys came over and wanted to know if he bowled. And he says, nah, I don't bowl singles, but I bowl doubles. 
<laughs> and he pointed to me. And so him and I bowled these two guys. We beat them for 40 bucks a piece. And they said, you guys are hustlers. They said, no, no, we're not. We're just being here. So they sent us to uh, uh, this Rome Bowling Center. Mm-hmm. He says, you want action? There's a whole bushel full. And we went in there and I bowled this potato farmer. And he beat me for 1500 I said, and, and, but he both, you, know, you got to understand, scores were never super high. I mean, this guy beat me, uh, I be, he beat me a three game set, and, and then I bowled him singing. Yeah, I said, ah, this is enough. So I went back to bowl for bowl, and they let me bowl. I must have bowled like 50 games. Okay, then I went back. And I, I'll never forget. I feel, feel even today. I feel bad about this about this because I bowled this one guy, and since the potato farm beat me, and I didn't bowl that good against the potato farmer, and the potato farmer didn't bowl that good. Right. But you know, you got to understand, one ninety two hundred two all was really good, and everything was close. You know, it wasn't two fifties, two sixties. It was close. So I bowled this guy, and I beat him for like. Eight or nine hundred, and we went out to the car, and we went up, and we were in the back, and we come around, and he must have went out the front, and he's walking down, and he's got his head bowed, and then I finally realized I beat him for his Christmas club money. <laughs> I didn't know what well, that was his fault. I didn't know. Right. <laughs> hey, that's what you gamble for. Then the next day, I went back. And you cannot believe this place. It was packed with people yeah. coming to get me. And I bowled this one kid and I bowled him. I bowled him a thousand a game. All right. Wow. And, and I bowled my three game set for a thousand. And I shot like 680 and he beat me. I said, uh oh. I told you, oh, this guy's pretty good. So next one, we bet 2000 and I made the, I'll never forget, I made the baby split in the tent, tent to beat him. Huh. I shot another 690 to his uh, 680 something. And the next game, I said, I think I got him. And I sent it, and I bet him like 3,000, and I crushed him. Crushed him. <laughs> well, what happened, we, the reason why, you got must understand that the bowlers that I was bowling, they did not bowl as many games as I did. Sure. They got tired. Yeah. And he got tired. This was the ninth game, nine games. And then I bowled him again, and then, and we really sent it in, and I crushed him. I couldn't believe how much money we made. Then we went to, they said, they went over to Rome, Rome, uh, uh, Utica, New York, which was close. And I bowled, I was bowling this guy two game, two game sets, 50, 50, and 100, right? Mm-hmm. He always won a game, <laughs> <laughs> but he never won the total. Yeah. You know, and, and, but he never had a chance. That guy never had a chance. Okay. Sure. Then I went back to Rome Bowl and said, I can't believe it. If we didn't make ten, twelve thousand dollars up there, what's it? But you gotta understand, you know, Rome Bowl and said, you know how many Italians were in there? <laughs> it, you know, I don't and these, know. I was gonna say these are these are potentially dangerous places. I mean, you're going in with you know with with friends, right? <laughs> uh, I know. I never feared anybody. Yeah. The only person you wanted to be fr- afraid of was me. <laughs> I never, I never, you got to understand, I come from New York City. I grew up in, in a, 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 the heroin gang oriented thing. I don't ever like to say bad things about myself, you know, but mm-hmm. I never feared anybody. The, the only person I feared was my father. <laughs> he had, now you see it? Well, when he went like that, he had his muscles like that. And then he made another muscle. <laughs> so, and and uh, you, you never lie, cheat, or steal, and, you, and don't do drugs. If you did drugs, he, he said he'd kill you. And he said, you shotgun, one for each eye, blow your head off. And yeah, scared me. I, when I was in high school, the, this one guy was like uh, trying to bully me and uh, uh, taking some drugs, you know. And, and then it was marijuana, you know, anything that marijuana. That, and I just looked him straight in the eye and says, you don't scam me one bit. <laughs> and he looked at me, what you mean? And I says, 
my father scares me <laughs> 10 times more than you. Maybe I'll bring him to, to see, come see you tomorrow. <laughs> and, it's, it's, and then he said, no. And then we became friends, you know. So I wasn't, if you were a nice guy and you, and, and you come across that way, okay, what you got to fear. You know, when I bowled it, now I was in, I'm the only professional bowler ever from New York City. New York City. Now, New York City, Manhattan Island. Okay, Johnny Bertragas from Brooklyn, Joe Barati's from the Bronx, uh, uh, Lemon Jello's from Long Island, uh, uh, Jimmy McHugh is from, from New Jersey. They were all from different. I'm only the only one from Manhattan that bowled on the tour. Yeah, Roth was New Jersey, right? No, he was Brooklyn. He was from Brooklyn, Rainbow Lane, uh, uh, a lot of it. But I'm the only one from Manhattan. Yeah. Okay. I used to bowl in Harlem Lanes, 125th Street and Broadway. Okay. I was the only white guy in the place. Okay. Uh, but uh, I knew Mar Murray, would, we, we were bowl and bowl, ton of action, ton of action. You couldn't believe the action it was. And they loved to get, but people don't understand at the end of the night, you beat the guy for, you beat him for all his money. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, but I never worried. Uh, you know, I, 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 I just don't know why. It, 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 I, I, I just don't know why. It's just I, I used to bowl in Lennox Lanes. Now Lennox Lanes was on 145th Street and Broadway, and there was a mixture of everybody. They had uh, uh, security guards in there. Same thing with Harlem Lanes. Tiny, tiny was six eight and about two eighty, and a gun as big as you know. You didn't fool with it. He made sure everybody, you know, I had a couple of times they would, and Tiny would, hey, and, and they, ooh, and they all stopped because you can't believe how big Tiny was. Nobody, you know, they, they, they wouldn't allow it. And Lennox Lanes was the same way. But Lennox Lanes, it was, oh, a ton of action, ton of action. Ooh. And I remember, and, and uh, the Harlem Lanes had a, a, a tournament called against heavy wood, all right? And I'll never forget, I was leading the, the, the tournament, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a phone call for me. Who the hell knew I was there? <laughs> <laughs> and it was for me. And it was this uh, guy, two guys came in for action at from Webster Bowl. And they wanted to bowl doubles, but this one guy, the one real good bowler, they didn't have a partner, and, and they called me. And I I, I didn't want to, hey, I'm waiting for the, 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 the tournament's almost over. I'm ready to collect my money. No, don't worry. Got in the car, me and my buddy, straight up straight up to there. And, and, and that's the first time I ever met Mike Lemangelo uh. when he was a kid. Yeah, he bowled, but... Uh, his partner wasn't that good. You know, <laughs> uh, Phil Lomenzo. I don't know if he's still alive, but he, yeah. uh, if Mike is listening, to, Phil wasn't that good. So I bought with this guy, Whitey Burt, and we we beat him for I don't know how much money. The, and uh, and they gave me a hundred bucks for out the day. For, uh, I didn't have to spend. I didn't have to bet a nickel. I was spend. I was there. They were sponsoring. Hey, anytime you bowl action and it don't cost you anything, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now I went back to Harlem Lanes. I won the tournament. Yeah, so yeah. you uh, you you talked about you know going on tour and uh, you started in 1968. Yeah. Um, and when I reached out to Larry Lickstein um, and asked him about you, he told me uh, that I needed to bring up something from the next season, from 1969. He said, just ask Ernie about the day before oh, practice no, no. <laughs> in Redwood City, 1969, <laughs> rooming with Larry. Can you can you yes. indulge us? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I was in Redwood City, California. I'm in the travel lodge, and it's a beautiful day. And I got my door open, and it's just nice. I might have been 80 degrees. And... Larry walks by the door and I said, hey, Lefty Larry. And he goes, oh, Larry, because I knew him from the action. Mm -hmm. And he comes in and he goes down and he cancels his room and he's going to room with me. Now, you got to understand, it's the summer in there. So he's got this his uh, uh, shirt bag and he hangs it on this 
thing, right? Mm -hmm. No big deal. Why you go to bed? Well, it gets cold at night, sure. right? And guess what? He hung it on it. He hung it on the heater. I don't know about two, two or three o'clock in the morning, and smoke is everywhere, and the alarms going up. <laughs> <laughs> he burned a hole. It burned a hole in every single one of his shirts oh, in the no. same exact spot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, it was the funniest thing. So he gets to the, the he gets to the tournament, and Harry Gold says to him, "Oh, you're the guy that almost <laughs> burnt the house." He says, "Mr. Golden, he says, I, I, can I bowl without a name shirt on?" He says, "I burnt all <laughs> made him get a shirt, otherwise he would find him." Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, but Larry to me was he was a hell of a bowler. Okay, and uh, he is was similar to like Kurt Flood. He was a hell of a bowler. He finished second at 19 years old against Dick Ricker in in the uh, in the the All Star. I think it was the All Star. I'm not sure. And then he came on the tour, and he won the only All Lefty Finals. Okay, and that was uh, the only reason that that happened is because the guy hated lefties, right? And he locked the doors and did the lanes itself while the machine was broken. And guess what? He went from eight lefties in the finals to 16. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Burden needed a strike to make the finals and left a solid 10. Uh, uh, solid 10 or seven. I know he's just stuffed it. He would have been the only righty. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hey, that was one of the greatest tournaments I ever bowled. And I, ne I never missed the pocket, but you couldn't <laughs> strike. You could not strike. I don't know why. Well, so lane conditions were always a factor for guys in them days. Okay. Okay. I got a story I was going to tell you. In 1968, my first tournament on the tour. All right. I get there. And we're bowling in Denver, Colorado, in Colorado Bowl. And then they, uh, they had A squad and B squad, and you would bowl. They had a two-and-a-half-hour uh, uh, practice says you can bowl anytime you want. So I will go. I must have bowled two hours, and you can't believe how many times I threw twenty in a row. And I said, "Wow, I'm not." And then I come in and I bowled the next morning. My ball was I could I thought I was part, parting the seed. There was so much oil. Hmm. I I couldn't believe it. I was two hundred on. I couldn't get the head ball to the head. It was going right more than it was going left. And what happened? The lame is oh they didn't want the 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 uh, B squad to have to have a, a real bad shot. <laughs> what happened to me? I was on A squad, <laughs> and that was my first experience on the tour when I knew things were were trouble. Yeah. Because now the next week I was on B squad and A squad got it. Wow. Uh, well, see, people don't understand the 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 format was was so unfair. Because you'd bowl twelve games on Wednesday and six on on, on Thursday, and if you made the cut, then you bowled eight on. Well, when you first bowled, it was you'd only bowl uh, uh, the only sixteen guys made the finals, okay, and then eventually you would bowl uh, twenty four. When they made twenty four. It was ridiculous. After that was where the turmoil really came into. They were that's where they were smart, all the fighting and arguing. Because if A squad had it and B squad did, and B squad was complaining, then B squad had an A squad, did. and after a while you'd have the every other. Mm -hmm. So you're on A and you you had the bad squad. Next next week you're on B. And you're on the bad squad, you're on the A, the bad squad. You know, so you might go 0 for 3, 0 for 4, 0 for 5, because, and you think you're ball bad. No, the, the lane conditions were different. But if they were four sixes, then it would, that to me was, and you, know, you can't believe how many times I, them added management again. Yeah. Okay, uh, the constant management, they were running what and how things were going. This is why you didn't. So after all oh, eight years, 
1976. In 1974 and 1975 were my two worst years. Okay, okay let me see if I got that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the history. Of the, okay. and, 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 and in them two years, uh, I made a couple of dollars, not enough to, uh, I, I always made a profit for my sponsor. But what about me? So I was surviving in a sense, okay, paying yeah. the bills and stuff like that. But I I thought it was, you know, here I'm now, I'm 32, 32 years old. I'm in Detroit. I'm sitting, sitting in the chair and just whew, I know I've never been depressed in my life, but I was then. I thought yeah. everything was over. And then I looked up. And boom, I couldn't believe it. There I was. And I'm not kidding. They were, I had a vision. And there it was. It was me on that wall bowling. And I was the bicentennial kid. I just, oh, wow, 1976, the bicentennial. Wow, boom. And you couldn't believe it. So now when I went to the bowl, it was the last stop on the tour. And I went, yeah, you watch me in 76. Yeah, I'm going to be here. Because all of a sudden, I was rejuvenated. I had something. I had something. And it was just unbelievable. All right. Yeah. And I was sitting in a stand at the same. And, oh, oh, and while I was watching that me on that wall, oh, a couple of seconds later, and that's just the truth, up popped another face. And was a, a woman. I said, "Wow, boy, she's pretty." <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know who she was. Yeah, a face I'd never seen before. So I'm sitting in the stands. I'm I'm watching Mark Ross bowl because he was my gumba, and then I was his doctor. I used to doctor his thumb all the time. So I, because it, if you listen to Mark when he bowled, you could listen to. You watch anything, you listen to it. <laughs> He's jamming his thumb and I don't know how the heck he ever he got out of it and with all that power you thought he'd hang it and kill himself you know and Burton Jr. was the same way huh? oh yeah you know yeah and so I'm sitting up there and all of a sudden I hear this voice say is that seat open Ernie and I Ooh, and there she was <laughs> And I get go like this, and I had this heavy set guy sitting to the right of me. The space was there, he wouldn't move over. I wanted to hit him. God damn it. <laughs> so she's sitting over there, and I'm leaning back. Where are you from? What's this and that, 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 and that? And after about five minutes, I knew, ah, that's that's it. And I yeah, knew yeah. she was Mark's girl. <laughs> I knew it. I said, oh, geez. So, but she told me she was an artist. I, but so I had this other idea too. It, uh, she, she was going to paint my bed art, art, artistically on my bowling bags. In them days, you carried your bowling bags. You, know? you had the uh, valise type thing with the handles, you know, the, uh, a naga hide. And I was going to have to paint some stuff on there for me the red, white, and blue, and the, and the fruit salad, and all that other stuff all over it. Okay. Yeah. And so. When she left, when Mark, he shot 279, you know, and then he was going that way, and she left her coat, and she, she went there, and then she, what'd she leave the coat for? <laughs> and the next thing you know, she came back, and Mark went down that way, and we started talking and everything, and uh, one thing led to another, and there I am 47 years later with a crazy woman. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, she's been my manager behind me. Uh, I don't believe everything would have happened without, you know, when you win by yourself, it's not the same as winning when you have somebody else. You know. yeah. But I had a lot of great stories about people I helped. Can, I, can, you know, can yeah. I uh, harken back to one about Mark? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I wrote another email, you know, you can see that's kind of a constant theme uh, with me and uh, asked Barry Asher about you. No. And uh, <laughs> Barry says that uh, in OKC in 1973, that you said you were going to best all the Jews, meaning Ross. I beat them all. 
until Norm I Myers it, until and I me, it. he said. <laughs> so yeah, and he said he crushed he, like a crush. he said that you beat Mark, and he said he you know pointed out. Remember, that's way before he was the world's best. Then Norm, but against me, you had two chances, slim and none, about two fifty to one seventy. Yeah, he crushed me. Yeah. But Barry, you got to understand, Barry and I are entwined in one thing is that when the PBA went again after me, okay, because of who I am, but they, you got to understand what I'm doing now, I was doing then. They knew I was a political activist in the sport of bowling, okay? And if I kept winning and winning, maybe people would listen. And they were afraid of that. Okay, I mean, and I would break their bubble or, or, they, or make them change whatever they were doing. But it destroyed Barry because he was slow. Sam Flanagan was slow. Uh, Dave Frame was slow. Dave Frame was like, a you thought I was slow. But people, when they bowl, they have a, uh, you know, like a, a quarterback has a, what do they call that in his mind? A, cl- a, a clock in his mind Oh, sure. It, it, to get rid of the ball. Yep. Okay. When you bowl, you have a clock in there when everything feels right and you go. Mm-hmm. Okay. Today, there would be no problem for me because they have a 25 second clock. I used to take 16, 17, 18 at the most. And I don't even think I took that. Okay, but 15 seconds standing in on the time that's a, an eternity. All right, you want to be okay. at six? Okay. It's already <laughs> awkward after six. <laughs> it's an eternity when you're bowling bad. Mm-hmm. All right, and they would, yeah, I'll give you another story. They were driving me crazy when I'm with the slow bowling. Okay. And uh, and they had a rule that when the, they go into the 10th frame, then the, you're not suppo- supposed to go into the set T area, okay, when the other ball is a ball. I'm, you know, I'm on a four bag going into the 10th frame, and, rah, and they're coming in and doing all kinds of things with their balls and stuff, and I hit the nose. And I left the sixth pin. And then somebody said something. And that's all I had. I blew up. I made the six pin, okay. Now I don't re rack. You gotta understand, because the only bad rack is the one you get nine on. Ask Randy, or, <laughs> okay. And the only one is the only good rack is the one you get ten on. Right. Okay. If you hit the nose and they all went down, must have been a good rack. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I lost my chance. <laughs> I lost my chance. Okay. So so when you go to ball in, in Jeez, I'm losing my train of thought again. Uh, uh, so, Trying to get, get been back where I'm about to help me, please. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, so when you're bowling and you have that clock, okay, yeah, I remember. Boom. So now I sat down and you're allowed five re racks. Wow. I made okay. the fair in the tenth frame. Guess what I did? Re rack. I re racked five. Times on the fill ball. Wow. <laughs> and, and you could hear them. You and they were out ready to explode. Yeah. And I, I oh geez, bad rack. Really rack. <laughs> oh, bad rack. Well, because that's unsportsmanship like conduct. No. And everybody that does that, you know, they're doing it for a reason. That's why score bowling for score stinks. Because yeah. everybody is fighting to get where they want in score. Mm-hmm. Okay, if I'm bowling you, I don't care if you come back tomorrow, two days, five days, it's just you and me. It's like a boxing match, yeah. okay? Mm-hmm. It's the only thing is if you're in a rhythm, okay? I get, did you ever see the movie uh, King King Richard? Boy, uh, I have not, King, no. Venus, <laughs> Venus and, 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 and Serena? Well, Venus was 14 years old. And I saw it. She was beating the number one by a bunch, and she was in dead stroke. And she went had a bathroom break. Nine minutes, oh. ten minutes. 
Okay. Yeah. So, uh, to me, that's unsportsmanship. Like, kind of that stuff should never happen in any sport. Even in football, it gets me aggravated. Sure. You know, a guy shooting field goal at the beach, hey, yeah, you lose, you lose. Right. To me, that's unsportsmanship. Like, kind of that stuff should be out of sports. Yeah. Out of sports. So I've got a few uh, a few comments here. Uh, same uh, gentleman, BSJ83, wants to know if you have any favorites currently on the PBA Tour and what you think of two-handers. Okay, Chris Barnes is my idol. Okay. okay. Let me explain what. I was bowling with this guy, a double stunner up in Seattle. His name is Ryan Olden. Okay. And... We bowled. First, the first three games he went to 192 or 180, and then he asked me, "What do you think, Ernie?" I said, "What kind of ball you got? Let me see." And I said, "Why don't you try that ball over there?" Mm-hmm. He shot 305 over for the next five. Good thing he couldn't carry. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when they talk about ball reps, I know what's right and what's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now we make the finals, and he calls his wife, and he brings his kid up. Now you got him. Uh, his kid was six at the time. His name is Chris, okay. or Chris, or Christopher. Okay, and 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 he's had at that time three heart, three heart, uh, tra- not transplants. They put in valves in okay. in his heart as he gets older. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they come up to bowl. They come up to watch it going to bowl the finals, right? And brings his wife. And we're sitting there. How are you doing? Is it cute as a button, this kid? And I asked him, I said to him, I says, wow, you know, if, and he says, Chris Barnes is his, is his favorite. I says, well, if your father bowled Chris Barnes, who would you be? He says, I vote for Chris. He was going to root for Chris. I couldn't believe he said I about fell off the chair. So I happened to have Chris Barnes, his number. Mm-hmm. I said, I got his number. So I get on my phone and I call Chris Barnes. Yeah. It's 15 minutes before he's ready to start the World Series. <laughs> and he answered the phone. Oh, wow. He answered the phone. I said, hi, Chris. Chris, I says, I got this young kid here, and, and, and you're his favorite idol. He's only six years old, and I explained to him, and he talked to him. Wow. Made his day. That's and awesome. Says, and from then on, he's my idol. I yeah. mean, he, what he did for that kid just, yeah. So, uh, uh, and I spoke to I, I sent him a text, too, so. Yeah. And, uh to me, yeah, two-handed, the ball is round, it'll roll. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, so when you, if you, yeah, wait, 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 about the ball, where's the thing about the ball? <laughs> yeah. He's well prepared. That's for I, sure. Okay. People tell me I'm well prepared. No. Ernie's well, well been, prepared. <laughs> this is 40 years of this stuff. <laughs> okay. Here we go. This is the one. Okay. All right. All right. Now, this is what everybody should understand. Okay. Okay. Bowling was always a ball bearing, rolling down, roll, rolling down 60 feet of lane to knock down 10 pins, not to break them. Yes, hook off the dry spot with lots of turn was always fascinating in the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s. And I just saw just look at Mark Roth. Mm-hmm. His power changed the game, but he did it with wrist power, not ball power. Okay? Yeah. And what I mean is when it was a sport, the ball was a ball bearing rolling down the lane, controlled by the ball of speed and stroke to knock down the pins. No help from the tremendous friction friction a hard hitting weight block does bowlers always wanted more so they didn't have to put in the work 
Hmm. When the game, I change my game every six months, whether I need it or not, because the game is always changing. And if you don't, guess what? You're going to have to work harder and harder to catch up. And that's what I mean. This is the only sport where they, where they, where they, not we, and what I mean, we, the players, change the ball from soaking plastic balls, more friction, to the black urethane angle, even more friction. Then came the black, blue, and red hammers that had similar friction, but had a heavy weight block. And then what was their hit? A hammer hits auto. Yeah, it hits auto. It's got a four pound weight block. I only got a three ounce weight block. (laughs) So when I tell people, because I work in a pro shop Mondays and Fridays, I mean, Mondays and Wednesdays. And I tell them, and I said, when you see the plastic ball, well, that's a ball tire. Mm-hmm. Then you move into the, the next level up. I says, that's a brand new tire. And then you see this, this is a tire with studs. And you see this one, it's a tires and ch- studs and chains. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But they all got to have this tremendous, powerful weight bar. The other ones, See that one, the plastic boy, has got a little teeny weeny weight block like that. Okay. I was I was on the executive board when when we we the bowlers outlawed the black black angle 22 to nothing. Then went to lunch and man and, and management overrided us. And with this opened the door to destroy the sport. Hmm. AMF. Brunswick, Columbia, Ebonite, Fabball, Hammer, Fabball, Fab, it was called Fabball before it was Hammer. It was Fabball, they put the hammer on the side. Right. Okay. And that's the other thing I invented. I put, I own Gemtech Incorporated, and we put the Phoenix on the side of the ball before the Hammer. Hammer says they did it first. No, they didn't. Well, I was. <laughs> that was all from my buddy. Uh, we used to sit there. Uh, he, it, you know, he, he lived down, down downtown New York. He said, Ernie, how come the three dots are on the top of the ball? Mm-hmm. You know, when I, you bowl, I see the side of the ball more than I see that. And and I always remember this. So when I got involved with Gemtech, I says, hey, when we make a ball, let's put it on the side. Okay. Yeah. All had a hand in this. They sponsored tournaments so their name could be mentioned on TV, which generated sales for them. When you made a show, the first thing you looked at was the incentive board. Okay, so when you made a TV show on Friday night, you go in and you look on the wall and you see what each each ball company was paying. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'll always remember this. I won't mention his name. He worked for Brunswick. And after a while, because AMF was getting on the ball, he would stand at the fax machine. Okay. And he had authority to override what they were doing, mm-hmm. the other companies. So when that thing came in and they theirs was seven fifty, you'd get a thousand. It was five hundred, you get seven fifty. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because when you're on TV, that's a fifty thousand dollar commercial for free. And sure. they paid, no, yeah, okay. Let yeah. me see where I am. Yeah, the first incentive board. And how much each company paid if you use their latest, greatest. <laughs> Since you were not with with a company, those incentives could make your year. Right. Okay. When I bowl Randy on TV, okay, and I use that bowling ball. Mm-hmm. I got twenty thousand dollars to use that ball. Well, you see the shirt I'm wearing? Yeah. On the t on that thing. Oh yeah. The, I got two thousand dollars for that. See it say see it say track up in the right. side. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay, so I got two thousand twenty thousand for the ball, two thousand for the shirt because it was some the marriage. See the wristband? Got fifteen hundred dollars for the wristband. See the patch? I got five hundred dollars for that. Wow. Well. Okay. Yep. All right. So the first prize was forty thousand. I made almost as much in the incentive as the prize one. So, so if the bowlers don't understand what's going on, then there's something wrong with them. Okay. 
Good. So yeah. you got to understand, I'm there for the little guy. Mm-hmm. Always have been, always will be. You know, I thank you all for listening. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, here, oh, yeah. I, I was going to say, I've got a couple more uh, here. Um, I, I'm supposed to ask you about the guy who faked a heart attack. Because he was ah, on the wrong side of both bets. That's the guy I crushed. Okay. His name was Iggy Russo. Okay. Okay. And I was there. So the, everyone said, no, 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 no. I and, was there. And we're back, we're back in what, the early 60s in the action? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was a, what's called a double dump. Okay. Okay. I'm bowling you, Fef. All right. You're betting on me. I'm betting on you. Ah, okay. <laughs> so okay. we're both trying to throw the game. <laughs> okay. All right. And... I leave the two, four, five, and the ten frame. Mm-hmm. If I get one, I, I, the one I tie. Two, I win. Yeah. Go ahead, eh, heart attack, boom, foul over the foul line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, and then they come in the ambulance and they take him away in the ambulance and he jumps out of the ambulance. Before <laughs> the okay. By the time he get back to his car, they cut it in half. Oh, you know, you know, I, in the old days, they, when there was a fire, they had the fire axe, that mm-hmm. big thing with a point on it. Yeah, they cut his car in half. Oh, my goodness. So he didn't care. <laughs> he didn't care. The other guy that was betting on you took won the money. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, um, so. I've got another one here. Uh, this is from Terrence McKinney. He uh, he was bowling in the MSC this past weekend. Got to talk to him, and uh, you actually hear his voice during part of the step ladder. Uh, but he mentioned that he bowled three pro ams as a kid and bowled with you all three years. And uh, he said you were really good with them. So good memories. Well, I, I am. I'm a. I'm not a coach. Mm-hmm. I'm a teacher. I can explain every single thing there is about the game, how it's played. How many pins are off? Did, okay, there's 60 feet of lane from the foul line to the head pin. To the, from the head pin back, it's two feet, three-eighths of an inch. Okay? okay. How tall the pins are, there's 39 boards, seven hours. Was, what do you mean 39 boards? Well, it's 19 and 19. It's 38 and the 20 boards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And them seven hours, four are for righties and four are for lefties. And why are they playing the fifth, sixth, and seventh hour now? All over the ball return. I'll give you another story. Uh, I'm bowling. I'm on nine and ten. I think it was on a nine and ten. I'm bowling with Eugene McCune. I'm okay. on lane nine, and it's his turn. He was standing on fifteen on my lane. Oh jeez. <laughs> bowling on ten. Lofting he was going the- over the ball gutter cap. He was going over to fourth arrow, a uh, seventh arrow to the gutter and coming back, and he struck. I come oh. look. That ain't bowling. That is not bowling. Huh. It's not bowling. Okay. Yeah. Bowling always was an easy game for me. I was a good marble shooter as a boy, and bowling was no different. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can't. Oh, man. The game. game well, I came from New York. No, that's good. Yeah. Not diminished. Or become a joke. It's becoming a joke because of the way this thing is going. It's just stupid, the game. All right. And the, the ball is rather using your thing. Do you see anybody ever play one, two, three anymore, or four, five, six, and second arrow? Yeah. Why don't you just take that part of the lane and just get rid of it? All right. yeah. Bowling balls were always ball bearings, controlled by feel of speed, roll, and angle, and how we got there. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's almost the same thing I was saying before, but the ball bearing didn't have a six, seven pound weight block. I didn't mind the friction change because we went from wood to synthetics, which moves the oil. But all players, shot makers, had a chance. And the TV, even when the urethane ball was out, it still was. I both awful good with the black angle. I played the gutter. I first hour, second hour, third hour. They, every the other guys were inside. But once you put the bomb inside the ball with the friction, yeah, and these yeah. high reps. Hey, if I, I give you another story, I'm not going to mention. You, have you ever heard of Kelly Kaufman? Yes. Okay. <laughs> he, if you saw her, the size of his wrist. Oh yeah. yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> and did you ever see? Well, I asked him 20 years later after he was off the tour. Mm -hmm. I says, no, with that amount of power, why didn't you use, because he was with Ebonite. Yep. And I said, why don't you use one of those Ebonite rubber balls or plasma or play the game right like me, right up second hour with 5,000 revs that you could put on your board? I don't think anybody could have beat you. Mm -hmm. Do you know what he said? What did he say? He was with the company. The company wanted him to use the. I don't uh, know. Sure. And every what time he missed, he got a four count. Yeah. Four. That's the first time I ever seen. Uh, I've seen a couple four counts. I left a couple, but that was on the funky racks and high boards. You hit a high board, the ball changes direction. Sure, but that's sure. the same thing. His. I mean, he used that that crush. I think the red crush ball. Mm -hmm. Oh, he. I mean, he annihilated pins. Yeah. But every time he got slow or he missed, it was a four count. So when you get accounts like that, you can't throw enough strikes. Can't keep up. And on, he couldn't make a spare. Why he couldn't make a spare? Because he was. Why didn't he use a plastic ball or a rubber ball? Yeah. Okay. I'll give you another story. And another story. Craig Daholsky, mm -hmm. another big moose. All right. He's in 12th in the regional, and I'm sitting back there. And he says, Ernie, what do you think? He said, why don't you get that ball over there? That's my spare ball. It was a hard rubber ball. He said, yeah, why don't you move over here, look over here, do that. 299. Wow. He shot. <laughs> okay? Because the ball is round, it'll roll. So he he went up into the friction, and he went, I, he went like 5 to 12, went right up there, and it just stayed there. Crunch, mm -hmm. crunch. It, because his power and revs. Yeah. Well, John Fantini, uh, I had a mineral light. That was the other one. He, I had a mineral light, right? He went right up, and there's no oil any bowling center in the United States on one, two, three, because the machine can't get there. Well, he went right up one, two, two, turn, turn the hell out of He shot 279 with that mineral light. Because wow. once the ball gets past the oil, it's all dry and then an angle. Okay. Yeah. So that tells me that bowlers with high revs could probably play out there and go around. That's why I said, God, I wish I was 40 years, 40 years younger. <laughs> and, and could I play? way out with these high performance boys. If you look at the, the when I beat Randy, mm -hmm. they were all in and I was out. Yep. But I'm the one that created that. People don't understand. I was probably the first guy to do what they did. Here, I, get a load of this. Uh, C Money Bowles says, I am that six-year-old kid he was talking about with Chris Barnes. Uh, he Ooh. says, tell Ernie hello for me. It's been a long time. Oh, Chris, where's he from? Where's he living now? I don't know. See Money Bulls, if you're if you're still with us, let us know. Oh, let us know in the oh, chat. Oh wow, he, <laughs> he's got to be. Wow, well, he's got to be eighteen, nineteen. Yeah, maybe a lot. Yeah. Oh, if he's still alive, oh, beautiful. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Well, phenomenal. He says, phenomenal. I, "I am here." Yeah, where where are you from? <laughs> let us let us know. Well, where is where is he? Yeah, yeah I where are you right now? Yeah. Um, oh, where's he, where's he live? He's currently 21. Okay. Mm -hmm. And where are you living? <laughs> Let us know in the chat. We'll put it up. Yeah. Or give me your phone number. Yeah. Or, or better yet, send it, send it to my email, bowlingwiththefeff at yahoo.com. I'll, right. I'll, I'll get mm -hmm. it to him. Um, he says he still, uh, well, live. He still lives in Gresham. Oh, good. Gresham, there you go. I don't go across the tracks anymore. <laughs> well, ever since COVID, you got trapped in. And, you know, yeah, I'm 80. I got I I travel for 40 some years. I, I uh, if I go 25 miles, that's a lot. That's sure. a long way. Yeah. You know, Here, here's another one. Uh, BSJ83 wants to know when you were PBA president, who was more difficult to deal with, Marshall Holman or Pete Weber? Pete Weber's my friend. And that's it. 
Okay, you remember I told you when I shot 258, 268, and the guy that was, that was the other guy. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> you know, well, Salvino was a, I love Salvino and everything, but he, he liked to be the center of attention. Okay. Well, okay, which I do too, but only when I'm doing things the right way. Okay, when I was bowling bad, I went into my cubby hole. Well, Marshall Holman was jumping around doing things, and he was, I had to do everything in my power to keep him out of it because I'm trying to make the finals. I went 258, 268, right? I one, two, three, throwing BBs up there. I saw it as hard as I could. You got to understand, I was only 100. I'm on, yeah. And I make the finals and come – that night, now here's another, another story. I, at that night, I was so tired because once you make the finals, you're on B squad, right? You're done. You made the finals, and you're done at seven. Mm -hmm. No, you're done. You make it. You're, you're, you're done. You're done at four, right? Uh. Okay, because your B squad goes twelve to forty. Other one going nine, right? I got like three. When I went back to ball the finals at seven o'clock, I was exhausted. Yeah. Now, let me tell you what happened. The last eight games. I take out my black diamond, okay, which is a hard rubber ball, rubber ball, and I won all eight games. Wow! <laughs> I went right up. I went right up the one, two, three, right at the pocket. Every time it hit the oil, it laid. I tripped so many four. I couldn't. I, so when I made the finals playing the gutter, if okay. I switched that night to the black diamond, I might have won the tournament. Wow! You understand? Yeah. Because I didn't have to throw it hard. The, sure. the, the surface, the, the surface was making you throw it hard. Yeah, and you could, and you. It's like a shot put. How long does the shot put lay? He, we ever see he throws one or two, and then he rests one or two. You know, otherwise, he's exhausted. Yeah, right. And I couldn't believe it. Sure. I get another same same bowling center. Years later, I made the finals, uh, and I averaged two fifteen. With just my thumb. Wow. <laughs> well, the lane, when the lane is hooking, that's friction. And you, there's two types of friction friction in the front and friction in the back. Why do you think they keep going left? Because they're looking for oil. Yeah. So that otherwise they can't play here. They got too many revs. There's too much friction. So they keep going left. Well, I don't go left too much. I put it this way in all the years I bowled less than 1%. Of my time, I have I've been left at the third hour. <laughs> yeah, I made I made a TV show playing the fifth hour. I made a TV show twice twice playing the fourth hour. But that was in the summer with no TV, so they didn't ever saw saw me play that. I can okay. play it every arrow on the lane. Okay, well, it has to be a certain way. Okay, I was four. I shot I I shot two eighty nine point in the fifth arrow with a black diamond. Falling back was the ugliest thing you ever wanted to see. Okay, <laughs> so I know how to bowl. I know everything there is, you know, but when it disappears, usually it disappears because of your strength. Yeah. Okay. So uh, when I, the same thing, hey, I was locked in 24th again, same ball in center of the friction, and I just put my thumb in the ball and went, I just shot 150 the first game. And then I tried something a little. I had the front eight. Wow. With just a thumb. The friction was coming from the lane. Yeah. Yeah. I won all I won seven at seven out of the eight. I lost the first game with 150. Pete <laughs> Couture. Okay. He was fighting for the for the front for the TV. And I started with a front aid with him. And I would go. <laughs> he, wanted, he wanted to kill me. <laughs> so, but then, yeah. hey. Yeah. Um so C Money says he will definitely reach out and uh, give give you his number. Um, like I said, bowling with the feff at yahoo.com. That way you don't have to, you know, put it out in the public, all that stuff. Uh, Jay oh. says uh, your famous line, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. <laughs> hey, Feff. Oh, yeah. When, when, when the, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, Duke was the next That's guy. The guy left the side, solid eight, and Duke went, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, Randy, if he's watching, I made you famous, more famous than you ever would have been. 
you never would have been famous if it wasn't for me. So don't ever. So when you next time you see me, shake my hand. But you <laughs> lost. It was a buzzer beater. Okay. Yep. I got I got some of the I got here, let me let me hearken to another story that I, I think you can probably elaborate on. So this is a, a message that I wrote to Charlie Tapp. Um, oh, Charlie Tapp. He, uh, he, you know, I, I kind of felt like this was right in his wheelhouse. You guys cross paths. So uh, he sends me this from the 89 season. He said, when he won in Hartford, he said, Ernie, your wife and him practiced on Monday night after the PTQ. He said, no one could strike because it hooked so early. You talked about the the friction. He said that you showed him one of your tricks by moving right and looking left. He said he thought you were nuts. Uh, Then in qualifying, the lanes got the same way in the night block. So he said, what the hell? I'll try it. He said he bombed the crap out of them, made the show, won the whole tournament. He said when the show ended, the phone rang and someone asked me for... You know, asked for me, so my wife took the call. It was you screaming at him. Uh, he said he thinks that you were happier than he was. No, oh, I was. I was. I was. I was in. I was in uh, Catskill, New York, in Hobo Bowl. Okay, That's where my 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 sister and brother-in-law live. They live in uh, a, a small, tiny town called Palmville, mm-hmm. which is which is uh, ten or twelve miles from Catskill. He, my brother-in-law, bowled. Holding a uh, uh, hobo ball, yeah, and I was there when I watched it in the bar, and I went absolutely nuts. I'm screaming and yelling at him. Ah, get him, Charlie! Get him, Charlie! <laughs> I give you another time. I bowled doubles with. I, I think I have this record. I got more. I have more records than most people think about. But they, uh. A record, I believe, will never be beat, similar to Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. Okay. After 18 games of qualifying, I led the tournament in Baltimore in 1976. I averaged 208. I was plus 150. Wow. Now, I'll show you how tough this place was. I was plus 150, and there was three or four guys ahead of me when I went to lunch, and they were on b squad. I came back. Hey, there I was. <laughs> and wow. I just was in AMF house. AMF house have bad racks. Okay. And no matter how many times you re-wreck, you got no chance. So, so I, I very rarely re-wreck because I'm focusing on making shots. And if, uh, but if you put your nose to the head pin, and you look at the racks. Okay, this is why I tell you about that game called headpin. Mm-hmm. And I would change my footwork. I might move a he- an eighth of an inch, move my eyes and turn to spin the ball and change to rattle them. You know, they, my, my nickname used to be called Heinz, Heinz, Heinz 57. Because... <laughs> Sometimes you hit the pocket side, you can't strike. Why? Because the pins are not perfectly on in spot. Mm-hmm. That's why Randy left a solid 80. He doesn't understand that rack was so wide. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, what real with the wide racks are, are good if they're fairly close, not close, close. It wide just a little bit. They're good, especially if you're playing the second out. But they leave solid 10, solid 8, solid 9, solid 7s, 4 9s, blow off 7 10s, and, and rattle in 5 7s. Hmm. So the percentage was more was worse on the right lane than it was on the left lane. Yeah. And I hustled Randy. And he, okay, when he was standing next to Kirk Von Kruger, mm-hmm. Kirk, and I heard him, Kirk said, to uh, ask him if who's going to start. And he said, Ernie. And I was like three, four feet. And I went, yeah, <laughs> loud enough for him to hear. Yeah. And he changed, changed it. And oh. he started. <laughs> I didn't want to finish on that. Cause if I needed a strike to win in that rack was like that. Oh, geez. But, you know, what mm-hmm. were you going to do? You know, when, okay. So that was the first hustle. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the, uh, people don't understand. Do you remember the PBA used to have a forum? 
PBA form, and they, and I mean them, what do they call them, trolls were in there, and they were bad mouth and bad, and I finally went berserk. I got on it, and I said, if you guys understood the game of bowling, like I do, let me explain it to you real close. Randy got a lucky strike in the first frame. You got to understand, I have a photographic memory about the games and stuff like that. Okay. And he, they collapsed in two pin. I went up, pack, pack. And when I got the second one, yeah, he's mine. You can hear me say yeah, that. You can hear it on the telecast. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you got to tell my intense line. I mean, I, I, you see how many strikes I throw against Boston. So then, yeah, I got. If I throw it right, you can hear Durbin say, wow, when he throws it right, it's flush. I mean, when he throws it this way, he's flush. When he misses right, it's flush. Okay. okay. So now I get to double, and I sit in the left-hand chair. He gets a ball, 7, 10, and then the head pin rolls over, and he gets lucky, and he gets a double. I was supposed to get up and move into the left, right-hand chair, and I didn't. He gets throws a really good shot back for the triple. I get out of the left hand at the left seat and walk to the, and I touch the ball. Once you touch the ball, people see this is the thing people don't understand. You cannot get a re rag. I touched the ball, I looked at that rag, and I go, oh, you I I thought I was gonna take the five pin out clean. That's how wide that rag was. If you go on that show, if you can pause it and freeze, look how wide that rag it was huge. It was unbelievably wide. So now I can't get a re-rack. But if you do it, then you're arguing with it. No. So I moved a little right, and I angled myself a little bit, and you can't believe that ball was up here, and I still left the 10. Because uh, they were sitting wrong. Yeah. I wasn't going to try to play it light, you know, rattling 5'7", there in no way. You know, yeah. and I wasn't going to try to come around, swoop it, blah, 7, 10. No, I'm to get him move a little bit right and a little bit left and just ram and jam. And I rammed it right, solid 10. Okay. Pack, pack. So I could have had the front five because if I moved to the right hand side, I would have re rack. Now, even though I don't re rack, I would have reached certain racks, I would re rack. If I looked at the head pin like this, if I could see the five on the, on the left side, that's a bad rack. Bad rack. How, you know how hard, how much power you need to get a strike when yeah. the five is a half inch to the left. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So, and then <coughs> I, I get this. <coughs> I get this double. I finally get the strike on the right lane. I get back and I miss my. Uh, I get and when I get the strike on the right lane. So I got double style ten. Double. So the first five were absolutely crushed. Yeah. Okay. Now I get them on my good lane and I get a half fast with my feet. I can feel it. And I thumb it down a little bit fourth. And you can hear me say, ah, I was so mad. Because that would have put them in, that would have put them away. Right. Okay. And once he didn't, I looked up in the sixth frame. I was one pin up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another story. I used I bowled this guy that he was the head of the ABC in, in, in uh, New York City when I got into the New York City Hall of Fame. His mm -hmm. name is Jack Clemente. I bowled him in this plate called Glenwood Glenwood Lanes in Brooklyn one time. He was up one pin in the sixth frame, three games in a row. I struck the game out. Guess what happened? I lost all three by a pin. Oh. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. I shook his hand. And I said, Jack, nice ball. No matter. In my Hall of Fame speech, I said, that. "Yeah, you. you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you lose, you lose. You have to know when somebody has the best of you." It's, yeah. uh, you know, so that's why I believe boxing and bowling should be the way it should be. You sometimes you you're great, and sometimes you're not. Hey, uh, uh, when uh, I'll never forget when uh, uh, in a regional, this guy Roger Leclerc here, mm -hmm. you know, right? We're going at it. He gets a nose dive in the tent, and but he threw it good, but slow. That's why he got the nose dive. <coughs> so now he gets him, and he must have moved a little ball left and threw it a little harder. He gets a rattling five pin for two fifty eight. Okay. And I went pack, pack, pack. I mean, two fifty nine, two fifty eight. Uh, How do you think he felt? 
<laughs> so, like another time, I bowled this guy, uh, Prince of Bell, right? Mm -hmm. He shot 134. I need a double to beat him. I struck out in the 10 beat of 140 to 130. <laughs> 134. So you got to understand, uh, uh, that's called winning ugly, and the other one's winning good. good. Yeah, so there's no such thing. No, that's why head to head is more exciting. You got to understand the action days when two great bowlers bowl against each other. If you saw how many people were in the back watching, okay? Uh, yeah. When you see a great boxing match, you know how many people were there when Muhammad Ali fought Joe Fraser? Oh, how many famous imagine. people were there yeah. paying big dollars for the front row seats? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, so, it's almost the same thing. Yeah, Ron M. I'm guessing this is, might be somebody you know. Says, "Bro, isn't it dinner time? Love you, dude." Oh, Me yeah. Ron Messenger. <laughs> Ron Messenger. <laughs> yeah, my buddy Ronnie. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Him and I. Yeah, yeah. he both. He was a ball. Was a ball. He don't ball okay. no more. Yeah. So, but all right. There's uh, a lot of guys, you know. So, yeah. But story. Uh, I made him famous too. <laughs> okay, the Bowlers Journal. Okay, mm -hmm. when I won the Touring Players Classic, if you can get, I'm on the front cover. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, the thing that you said. If you look to the right, if you look to the right, he that's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It can when you where I when the ball when the, the, the thing you showed in the beginning of me bowling. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I Let's don't know. See. He might even be in that picture. This one? Oh, he's he's to the right. <laughs> you get his yeah, yeah, that one. He's to the right. Okay. Because <laughs> okay. when they took the picture, that when they took the picture on the Polish journal, he's there like this. You know, these glasses. <laughs> I told him I made him famous. Yeah. yeah. I've got another another couple comments I want to get to. I do I do not want to forget my uh, my my weekly plea though, and that is for people to subscribe to the channel. Um, a lot have in the last uh, week or so. I'm I'm guessing you know I have you partly to thank for that, Ernie, because you're gracious enough to come on. But uh, yeah, hit that little logo at the at the uh, corner of the screen. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, yeah. You know it certainly helps me create content here. And if you hit the notification bell. Uh, you can be among the first to know uh, when we go live and put up new videos and things like that. Um, C Money uh, says that he sent me an email uh, with his contact info, and thank you for passing it along for him. So I will certainly get that to you at the end. Because um, I always wondered if he uh, what was snapping him, because uh, I've known him since he was a little kid. And yeah. you should see him put turn the ball <laughs> when he was eight years old. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll get you in contact for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I, Jay, lost, I lost contact with him. That's why. Yeah. Uh, Jay, and I'm guessing I know the answer to this, but Jay wants to know if you regret your reaction to your competitor getting robbed on the perfect pocket shot, asking for a friend, LOL. I don't think you regret your reaction uh, when you won the 95 TPC, do you? My brain? No, it's, it's, it's a buzzer beater. Yeah. A buzzer beater. Okay, uh, another story. <laughs> 35, maybe 40 years, well, 30, 35, 35, yeah, about 30 years before that, I bought Mike Lemon Jello okay. for a lot of money. Yeah. Okay, and I needed a strike to win. Mm -hmm. I threw the ball, I got down on my knees, and I was pulling the string. And his buddy, his name was Cliff Berglund, was standing there. And he jumped up and screamed at the top of his lungs, Summer! Well, that's what was going on in my mind when Randy threw the ball. Because I'm sitting behind him, and I saw, oh, man, he threw that ball good. Randy, you threw it good, just to let you know. And I knew he threw it good. And, I'm, and in my mind, I go, oh, no! And when he left it, I, that's what was done. I went berserk. It's like a buzzer beater. Yeah. So, you know, it, hey. You think Joe Barati, when he got that cross hit to win the U.S. Open, do you think he it bothered him? <laughs> no, yeah. I don't. Uh, BJ, uh, or no, I'm sorry, BSJ 
uh, 83 says he watched the 81 uh, PBA national championship on YouTube a while back and you were wearing a unique bowling shirt. I think I've seen that one too. Uh, what led you to wear those shirts and do you still have them laying around? I can't get, I can't get my half my body. Is a, I was, I had a 29 inch waist. I weighed 155 pounds then. I run. I was running 50 50 miles a week, and I was working out three days a week. I was in top shape. I can make that ball talk six languages, you know. Uh, and if you ever thought about being a bowler, you must be in great physical shape. And you look in any sport. If you're not in great physical shape. I don't think you could be top of the, yeah. But then I look at Pete Weber, smoked like a chimney. Uh, Don Duke smoked like a chimney. You know, would they have been greater? I don't know. Could be. I don't know. <coughs> <coughs> I think Pete would. Have. Pete would. Pete Weber to me was the greatest bull, but he had issues. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, he could uh, do more with the ball. Earl was just phenomenal, phenomenal. Earl and Carter, okay, if you put two eras together and two great bowlers, uh, it, to see them two bowl against each other, ooh, would that be? Because yeah. Carter had the touch and the feel. I bowled Carter once, he said 299 against me hmm. in Toledo. Second hour two, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I think no. Did, is that where he made? He, he did, I think that might have been his last show. Okay. And as and Larry listening, Larry just did, Carter says to Larry, "Yeah, you throw me that ball. It's a uh, buck forty-five." <laughs> <laughs> I remember the Larry told me that story. I said, oh, you, you ruined my career. <laughs> oh, hey, man, what a super nice man. Super. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Yuck says he was at Robert Morris College that night for the telecast. I'm guessing he's uh, talking about the 95 TPC. Let me ask you about another one of your wins, uh, because uh, I don't think you've brought this up, at least this gentleman's name. Um, but, uh, of course, in 96, uh, six months after the 95 TPC, you won the ABC Masters. There's a picture of you with your trophy in check. Um, before the telecast ended... They interviewed you really briefly, and you said that you were dedicating the tournament to John Mazio. Can you tell us about John, who he was? Okay, John John Mazio was my mental game advisor. Okay, uh, I was a three pack a day smoker. Okay, uh, and then uh, uh, well, let's get to the beginning. In 1976, after the after in Waukegan, Illinois. I just shot 250 on those, all right? And if you see Joaquin and you come out of the ball and send, you make a right, and there was a, a little hot dog stand out. The, and it's called, the, uh, what the hell was that? <laughs> the dog house it was. I felt like I was in the dog house. I was 250 <laughs> on the, I was ready to cry. And me and my wife are sitting there. I never met anybody. You got to understand. My wife meets everybody. Well, uh-huh. they meet meet my wife. So I was sitting there and my wife sitting there and this guy sitting next to him and he introduced himself to my wife and he said he thought he could help me with anything. And I, I wasn't even listening. I was hungry and I was eating. I was depressed. I was mad. And he worked there. He was in uh, uh, work for alcoholics and, uh, and drug addict clinic. Okay. <laughs> And he thought he could. So I told him I was both. And he, so we introduced it. And then he came to the World Open in, in okay, in Chicago. He was, that's where he lived. So he come from Waukee, <coughs> Illinois, he came to Chicago to watch me bowl in there. I finished second to Gary Dickens. And that's another <coughs> story. Uh, and we started to become friends. And uh, in 19... 19- 77 i took him on a tour with me okay, okay. and uh we used to go for these 
four or five mile walks and just talk and talk. And because and, I wanted to know the, uh, the, uh, the human nature, what makes people what they are, how, what. Because he told me this one story. He meant that he had this absolutely beautiful girl. She was like 24 years old. He says, Ernie, you wouldn't believe how beautiful she was. But she was an alcoholic. And he get a fit and she right back. He just, uh, it's just, it, it's, it's a shame. He couldn't believe it. So we talked about that. I had it here. And, and I can't remember where it is. And I asked him, and he asked me, what was your biggest weakness? And I said, cigarette smoking. I said, if I could give up smoking or figure out, because I quit smoking many, many, many times. Okay. But I always had the urge. Mm. It's like a drug addict. Yeah. And he said, well, I could show you a way. And that's what rung the bell. Yeah. And uh, in the, in the, in the February 14th, 1978, I wrote a contract to myself, which I still have, and he signed it. And that was the beginning of my quitting. I didn't quit. It was the beginning. And what you do is from February 14th to March 6th, I wrote all the negatives and then all the positives. All right. Mm -hmm. And then on March 6th, I went out and bought six cartons of cigarettes. Yes, it would, and people said, ooh, and that's what he wanted. So every waking moment, I had a pack of cigarettes, take one out. Every waking moment, I smoked. So it was, yeah. And right. that's what he wanted. And then on March 21st, 1978, because I just passed my 45th birthday. Yeah, yeah this is the 28th, a week ago. That's why I wanted to, this, uh, to do this last week on my uh, my anniversary okay and on march 21st when i woke up well from march 6th to march 20 20th i would read all the pos negatives and all the positives you keep reading while you're smoking until you memorize them you convinced right. yourself that it was a bad idea well you memorize them so then when I woke on March 20th, I, every piece of tobacco I rolled up and smoked so there was no more. So when I woke up, it was March 21st uh, at 2 a.m. It's when, when I woke up that day was my quitting it. And as soon I had an urge, I blinked my eyes and I started reading all the negatives. And by the time I got to the last positive, the urge would go away. And then it was six minutes, then it was 10 minutes, then it was 20, the 40, and then it kept going and going. And after about three months, there was no more urge, but I always used it. And I've never had the urge before again. And here's the funny part. Eight and a half years later, my arm, I watched it, went like that by itself, by itself, because that's where you used to keep your cigarettes. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, by itself, I'm scared to live with daylight <laughs> <laughs> by itself. Sure. Okay, uh, and I've never smoked. Never, I've never had to. But when I get around people, ooh, it just, it, it just. Uh, well, when I lived here, okay, and I used to bowl on a Monday night, my wife would sleep with me. She's no, you stink to high heaven. Oh, like, okay. And I didn't know what I'm, she was talking about. She says. This is what I want you to do. Take all your clothes off, put them over there in the corner, sleep in the guest room. When you get up in the morning, smell them. Oh. <laughs> that did it, huh? <laughs> and that was me. So that's why I tried to get, quit smoking. So, And he helped me quit smoking, and he traveled the tour with me for about four years. I paid him. I was paying him a salary, so people don't understand it, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, and was it seventy nine? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, nineteen seventy. Yeah, nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, I think it was seventy nine or eighty. Yeah, seventy nine was before I won. Uh, I'm bowling in in Las Vegas, and he's in the back. All right, and I shot three hundred to one. He said hey, this guy. His name was Eddie Drunicki. He was from South Africa. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. And he was trying to get somebody to come there. Mm-hmm. And he was talking to John. He said, yeah, man, oh, yeah. And John was affiliated with me. And mm-hmm. when, so I negotiated a deal to go there. Okay. I took, it was me, it was supposed to be me, Joe Hutchinson, Tommy Baker, Betty Morris, my wife, and John. Wow. Okay. But that was uh, the the air traffic controller strike. I think so. I think we went there in 80, 81. I can't remember that. It was, but that's where we negotiated and then we were going to go there. And that's when they had the, the air traffic controller strike. Okay. We were supposed to fly out of, out of Kennedy. Well, Tommy was coming from Buffalo and he was flying into into Newark, and then he was. I said, "No, why don't you?" Just, and but he just met a woman too at the same time. So he changed his flight. He got stuck in uh, in Schenectady or somewhere else before, he, and the flight. So he didn't go. Uh, okay. okay. And my, so my wife had to fill in. Uh. <laughs> my wife's a pretty good. My wife, if. She's had three, she shot 300. She's a, always, she was, I got her, I took her from 120 average bowler to average over 200. Wow. Okay. She shot a couple of 300s. She should be in the, the Clark County Hall of Fame. Okay. She, her and her girlfriends won the team events, the doubles, the singles, and they won everything. Yeah. She's won the singles, the all, uh, three, she got trophies upstairs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, here, I've got a I've few more done. here. Um, let me see. Uh, Jay says he considers Earl Anthony to be the goat. Uh, do you feel this way or have any interesting Earl Anthony stories? And I'm going to put you up full screen uh, because while you answer this, I've got some weird noise going on over here that I'm going to turn off. So tell me about, oops, I, I should probably put you up, not myself. Uh, t- <laughs> tell me about, uh, how you feel about Earl and, uh, if you have any interesting stories about him. Well, just- Earl Anthony's wife, first off, is my wife's best friend. Okay. <laughs> and if I say the wrong thing, I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, Carter was the greatest bowler in the world in that era, the, the 40s to the 50s. Okay. No, the, the 50s. At the end. And then Weber was the greatest in the 60s. Anthony was the greatest in the 70s. Okay. Uh, And I thought Mark Roth could have been better than him in that one sense, but he always had that thumb problem and I couldn't get him to understand how to fix it. Okay. Because, but he changed the game, Roth. Earl was just, I mean, he was just, his, if you clocked him, okay, or took pictures out of them. They don't look. This, they look. You wouldn't know one. One. Uh, one. Uh, uh, one. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, they would look exactly the same. Uh, the, the strips. They would look the same. Uh-huh. I mean, but you gotta understand. He was six one, one ninety five. Had a big rear and a big legs. I mean, he hit the line like a rock. And he just the, the speed was the same. The same. The same. That's all. Well, when I was in dead stroke, I was the same as that too. Okay, but most bowlers are like that. Okay, when you're in the zone, but he just was in the zone more often. <laughs> okay, and when he, one of the things that makes a great bowler is when he knows he's lost. Okay, I'll give you a story about Earl. Earl came into the locker room screaming and yelling, man, Larry, 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 I got nothing. I got blah, blah, blah. And so Larry, so Larry drills him a ball. And Earl says, what's it going to do? None of your business, Earl. Just go throw the damn thing. <laughs> he, won the, he won the tournament. Wow. <laughs> he won the tournament. Well, he put uh, – Earl probably wasn't getting any role because he probably had think uh, the in them days, weight, the static weight meant something. So he probably was always using finger side or side. This guy put a, Larry put thumb and negative in this ball, ball rolled around. He won the tournament. Mm-hmm. The ugliest thing I ever saw Earl do 
I mean, it was a good. He was playing the fourth, fourth. I think he finished second playing the fourth hour. It was the ugliest thing I ever seen in my life. Huh. Because he always used to play, you know, between all the way to 51. But he was inside the fourth hour and it looked ugly because he didn't swoop it. It's, it's, he did the same when I play inside. I do the same thing, girl. It looks ugly. We're going straight, and he finished second. You know, so who's the best? Yeah, uh, in each year, who's the best now? Walter was. Who's the best now? Bel Belmo. You know. So how do you compare them all now? I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, <laughs> now. Because when I went to, to to lunch with my physical physical guy, we okay. talked about that, similar to that, okay? But it was mostly in boxing. Uh, okay, if we bowl the way I believe bowling would, should be, okay, Car uh, from way back, Carter, Weber, Anthony, Schlegel, Roth, Pete Weber, all these great bowlers against each other, then you could see then you'd know. Who's the best? Meaning that, well, who's the greatest boxer in the world? Muhammad Ali. No, he isn't. No, oh, Rocky Marciano. You bet your <laughs> 49 and 0. 49 and 0. I'm a Muhammad Ali fan. Yeah. He was 49 and 0. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and he was only 195, 200 pounds, Marciano. But if you ever saw his back, and he, but. Uh, Tyson was only 208. Mm -hmm. But why was everybody afraid of him? He was a hit with atom bombs. Yeah. Okay. And, and he was fast. And so was Marciano. Marciano, I remember, he would didn't try to hit you in the face. He didn't try to he hit you in your forearms. And mm -hmm. bam, he would almost break your blood. And your hands would come down. Uh -huh. And he would knock you out. Yeah. So he always had a game plan. Sure. Ali, they couldn't hit him. He was so fast. He was, he was the best because they uh, uh, they took away three of his. He might have went forty nine and oh, anyway. Yeah. Okay. They took. That's why I consider myself similar to Muhammad Ali. They took five years of my best bowling life away from me. When you got to understand, when the full roller was dominant. I was great, not good, great, okay? Yeah. Because that was what the way bowling was. It was second hour, two, oh, geez. The scores I could see. If you saw some of the numbers I shot when I was just uh, unbelievable. And in the 10th frame, I was just phenomenal. But then when the game started to change, you got to understand, I quit bowling when I was 22 and a half. But I went, no, the action was dead. Mm -hmm. I couldn't become a PBA member. I just became a bum. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything for two years. Just, I went out and hustled. My friend, uh, three of us roomed together. The uh, brand new two and a half room apartment rent was $50. 150, 50 bucks. I go out and make my money. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then all of a sudden they go, oh, wow, they're going to allow me to become the, and I couldn't throw full roll no more. Uh -huh. it, it just, it, because the game started to change. So I started to change to a three quarter roll. I went from like 210 to 180. Sure. I, you know, I, I couldn't make a spare. <laughs> I could, my ball hooked it and, and uh, my ball hooked this much. Everybody said, couldn't hook. My ball hooked so much, I threw more strikes. But I couldn't make a spare. Yeah. And, that, and uh, to a guy that's a phenomenal spare shooter, I was it, I was ready to. Uh, it was hot, to, and, and then I started moving things around a little bit, and my roll got right up there. Yeah. And I'll never forget it. I was averaging like 180, 182, and this guy, uh, he's probably dead now. His name is Paul Bonabo. It's left-handed. He was giving me some business, and he was like 195, and I was 182. And I said, look, I'll bet you. And then all of a sudden, you got to understand, when you know, 
and I, all of a sudden I knew this is a, I says, I get you one. I'll bet you $25. I beat you in high average. Next week I shot 690. He shot 490. I shot 680 <laughs> and 680, 680, 690. And all because all of a sudden I can make a spare. I would throw more strikes with the three quarter, you know, because the game changed. Yeah. The tracks were different. To, uh, I loved wood more than I ever loved anything else. For the simple reason, uh, in wood, you see these little slivers of, of brown boards, dark brown, mm -hmm. and then you use them as range finders. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and they were high boards. And I yep. could see them, all right. And in the hub bowling center, which isn't there anymore, at twenty lane balls, I would have bowled any human in the world. In that I used to bet on two fifty, yep. bet against two fifty. I said, I'll bet you on two fifty or better. Mm -hmm. Lane ten was lane ten. I could stand there and throw a hundred in a row. It just just strike, strike, strike. But lane nine had a high board. Mm. And I'm the only one that struck on it because I would ride the high board right into the pocket. Mm -hmm. If you saw them, and I put it this way. When I bowled the sh shortest bowling, the shortest action match I ever had, I bowled a guy on 80, 86th Street, 89th Street in New York City. I'm going down. We're going to bowl for 20 a game, right? And he's practicing while I put shoes on. I put my ball on the thing, and I was using a red Jubilee. And he asked me, What's that line? My line on my ball was like this a little black line all the way around that red ball. I said, No, that's my track. And I was the end of the match. <laughs> <laughs> I should have said, <laughs> Ball went right in. Yeah. Okay. But you got to understand, nobody bowled as much as I did. Nobody practiced the things I practiced. Okay. Low scrub, head pin. All, all kind, how to chop, the, how to do this, how to do that. And uh, uh, when you play low score, you learn how to make spares. I mean, splits. Okay, if two great bowlers are there, strikes. Mm -hmm. Then it's spares. And what's next? Splits. splits. Okay, when I got involved with Gemtech Incorporated, I made a four pound ball. I was trying to make a three pound ball. Okay. Okay, the reason why? Four six. Oh, I got a four pound ball. I threw it at the six pin. It bounced and it almost bounced in deflection to make the four. Okay. And then this guy, he was the rookie of the year. He went, "Oh, let me see that ball." I said, "Don't throw it." He threw it hard and cracked this. Side. Cracked it. <laughs> he it hard. Yeah. Okay. When I had an operation on my neck, okay. Oh, I don't know how many years ago it was. I started with that four pound ball. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I I drilled it for myself, right? I shot 82 the first game. <laughs> okay. And in the second game, I got the rhythm and the flow. And you had to see it. I threw the ball really going to pack it right in the pocket. The ball actually stopped. And then <laughs> went around the five. I left a five, seven, ten as clean as a whistle. <laughs> so deflection. The yeah. ball was too light. It could, could, could it was the funniest thing ever. Well, it stopped and went around the fudge. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then so when you're teaching and you got people that use a six pound ball or an eight pound ball or ten I was teaching this lady a ton, a ton of times and she had a ten pound ball. I got her to hit the pocket, but she looked a 5'8, a 5'8, a 5'7, 5'7, 10, 5'8, 10. You know, it's just it's the weight of the ball. And it was a high performance ball, too. Okay. It's a friction we could get it, but it couldn't couldn't knock them down. Okay. You know, so now she's I got her up to a 12 pound ball. <laughs> so, so, so you know, Ron mentioned, you know, aren't you missing dinner? Uh, we've gone over two hours, so I want to kind of wrap things up. Yeah, um, that sounds good. On, yeah. on this show, um, as I told you before we went on, um, I do this thing called Off the Sheet, where I ask you to challenge somebody else. And, uh, you know, skill level, you can throw it out the window. Uh, you know, we look for bowlers who uh, are passionate about the sport and have a unique story to tell. Been on this show? What's that? <laughs> Is Randy Peterson. <laughs> he has not. He oh. has not. 
do I have to get a hold of him or you? Oh, no. No, you you just tell me why. <laughs> tell me why you want me to bring Randy on the show. <laughs> well, then he could give his thoughts about how he lost. Yeah. All right. <laughs> no, no. Well, one of the things I felt bad about, and uh, Brian Voss uh, was always my friend on it. So Brian, uh, uh, Duke, uh, Pete, Mike Edwards, you know, we were like a goombas, all right? Yeah. And because, you know, you had all these clicks on the tour. You know, uh, in Willie Mays' book, the reason he didn't like the reserve clause was because of that. Because if once they broke the reserve clause, the Pfeffer, it becomes a, 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 a you become a, a free agent and you're gone. But yeah. you and your wife and the kids and me and my wife and the kids and all that, we used to go to eat together because it was always in the summer. You eat together, you, you play, the kids play together. So they know everybody. That's why he was against it. Right. Okay, that's the only reason. And in, on the tour, my family, and this is a, everybody that's out there, that was my family. Okay, you know, like uh, there was Voss, there's Duke, and, uh, uh, Mike Edwards. Uh, I don't, I don't want to miss anybody. There was, there was like ten of, ten or uh, twelve. Weber, Pappas, Weber was Pappas, Even though I don't see Pappas anymore. Well, we used to play a game called Pangini. Okay, Harry Gold. We're at George, George Pappas. We're in Kansas City. We're at George Pappas's uncle's house, and the three of us are playing pan. All right, when I was uh, I, I wasn't in the hand, I said, get him, George. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're always against the goose. You know, uh, so, but George was uh, not so much. But we were goombas in the sense maybe in gambling. The same thing with uh, uh, Roy Buckley. Roy Buckley. And I, I felt bad when Roy died. I Because his wife and my wife and uh, my daughter and his daughter were close at, uh, at some time during that. And uh, one of the things I always, always remember, we were at the Tournament of Champions and we were, and I can't rem remember, we were at a bar, at the at the bar somewhere where, where the thing, and he was sitting next to me and he knew. And he said, acknowledge what they were doing to me. The only pro of all the pros, he knew. Yeah, he said, yeah. But, but again, when I told you about Barry Asher, when they pressured me in slow ball and they couldn't, so I couldn't get a lawsuit against him or some whatever that was, they hassled Flanagan, but he was from West Virginia in one ear out the other. He, you couldn't make him move. He would never move. Same thing with Dave Frame. But he made him a little more edgy. But Barry screwed him mentally. To the point where he couldn't bowl, and he couldn't go. He all of a sudden he couldn't bowl no more. They took his trigger away, and my my mental game and my visor. He, he used to work for Brunswick too, and he was stationed in uh, uh, in Vegas. I mean, not Vegas, L.A. And he worked with Barry. He just couldn't couldn't break the couldn't break it. Okay, uh, when you lose your trigger in the game of bowling. You better try to figure out a new one. Yeah. I've lost my trigger two or three different times. You know who Joe Morgan is? Sure. The baseball player? Mm -hmm. I used to, that was, that's how I would go. Now I go, whew, my breathing is my trigger. I used to always have a trigger. So when you're sitting there and you, you watch, I, I, I Mike Lemongello here. Mike, ooh, wait, let me get to my hand. Oop. Here, let me, Finger would tap here. the ball. Finger uh, would tap the ball, and he would go. Uh, Marshall Homan, he would. You got to say he would rock the ball. Tommy Baker, uh, everybody had a trigger. Yeah. So when you're bowling on tour, uh, you got four guys to the left, four guys to the right, four guys. If you're skipping pairs, there's four. So there's four, eight, twelve, and three guys on your pair. That's fifteen guys, all wanting to go at their pace. Or they, I don't call it their rhythm. Rhythm. Some yeah. guys like to go real fast. Some guys like to go real slow. They're not slow. Me, I'm a metronome. 
And I believe that's the way you should boast the ball. You ever watch uh, No More Cards? Yeah. yeah. Six, seven. He, seven times before he got in a box. Mm-hmm. He, he was straight. If he played now, he'd be out. God. Yeah. Well, one of the things I don't like about baseball, they're very, very, very superstitious and everything. Yeah. I'm not superstitious. I don't believe it. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in uh, superstition. It's just part of life. Yeah. Some days you get it. Some days you get the elevator, and some days you get the shaft. But uh-huh. My glass is always half full, not half empty. It's always been that way. So, so uh, if you if you're not, I've never been negative, never in anything. Uh, the only negativity I ever had in my life was when they drove me absolutely saying they were stealing my money. The PBA. The old PBA. I can say that now because they're all dead. <laughs> they, 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 and the ball has allowed that to happen. Okay, yeah. that's why I didn't have too many friends on the tour. Because of it, I was not with a ball company. My money was coming from my talent, and they were affecting my talent, which was affecting my living, and that was that really bothered me, and it still bothers me because I never made the top fifty. There's four guys in there that couldn't carry my bag. Okay, and, and that's what Harry. That's what Harry Smith said about somebody. And I won't mention the person he said about, and I always remember that Harry Smith probably was one of the greatest bowlers that ever lived. Yeah. But he was like me. They didn't like him. He was a drinker. Hmm. Okay, number one. And he, argh, how do you have to call him? He, they hated him. Yeah. Of the story again. He was in Tucson, Arizona. He needs a strike to win. He throws the ball and he runs out the door of the ball that runs all the way around, comes inside this side of the door, argh, like this to the to the fans. Yeah. Because they were rooting all the time for the other guy. He, they changed the format so many different times for him. I mean, he made, and they still couldn't. Oh, you make the finals, they drop the wood. They got this, the, the, uh, they make the TV, they tried uh, round robin. They tried everything. They just couldn't stop me. He, he was that good. He snapped it. If you watch him, the amount of leverage and pop, he didn't hook the ball. But oh, that was so that ball was humming down there with power. Yeah, it was unbelievable. But the tour before I was, they must have been nasty. Must have been nasty. They too, because I I loved Harry. But one time I always knocked him out. Because I well, he, he I'm getting up and I'm on strikes and he re racks while I'm up there. Yeah, and I told him I said you know. You do that again, you're gonna be bowling left-handed. <laughs> you know, I says, you don't do it again. So, but I learned that with Jim St. John. You know, I sw- used to sweat a lot. I used to wear the Carter glove, and I sweat a lot. And I'm bowling in Toledo, and he's up there, and I, I'm sitting on thing. I put my hand in the KA, and he stepped back. He says, "You, you do that when it's your turn." <laughs> Yes, sir. I like, understood. Like another guy that got, uh, uh, they did, didn't see the bowl is understood, mm-hmm. but they couldn't do anything about it. So yeah. the power structure was only promoting certain people. So without a union and without a unity, only these guys are going to make money. They, they're going to make, they made Carter and Weber famous. Yes, they knocked down the thing, but Carter had the Carter glove and Weber had the Weber wrist mask. What do the other guys have? Okay. Yeah. And Jim St. John was a phenomenal boy. They used to have the world, the, the, what was the, the world? There was a t- tournament called the Worlds. Okay. He won it by 1,500 pins. Um, yeah, because he was the first guy to ever play the gutter. Nobody yeah. could play the gutter, or no one ever seen it. And he went out there and he played the gutter. Hmm. Left handed named Johnny Meyer finished second by 1,500 pins. That's what I heard. I didn't see it, but <laughs> he was. Yeah. So, so something must have happened there because he couldn't stand the PBA. Yeah. 
There was a lot of guys like that, but you, it's like the power of one. I tell you, I'm the power of one. If it can happen with Kurt Schmidt and everyone out there that's listening, Kurt if you Flood. understand, it, Kurt Flood, if you understand what I'm talking about, there has to be unity. And, uh, and you should get Chris Bonds to be your union rep. You got that, Chris? I hope you're watching. You could be the man. You could be the Kurt Flood. Yeah. I hope so. the only I'm way watching he, too. He can he, he can be another one to come on. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'll talk to him about it. Well, see, one of the other things is is that I did 64 guys. They tell me there's 64 guys on the tour now, and they only bowl on one squad. Which huh, where was I? I used to say this about Ralph Fanger. He was 10 years too late. Well, guess what? I'm 20 years too late. This is what I always felt it should have been. One squad. If they if they pour, poured water on the lane and everybody bowled in the same time, that would be equal. Right. Okay. But as long as you qualify, it's for score. And when it's for score, who's your enemy? The you know, field. Bowls. Yeah. Okay. The field. And they did some tricks and things on the tour. If, Thank God I had John Mazio. I'm telling you, they didn't know how violent I was. I could have been, you know. That's why I did. I I had a mental game advisor, not f for the mental part to keep me from hurting anybody out there. Was just it, they're trying to take away my living. Yeah. You know, you, you ever see some, a lot of these uh, the uh, uh, cop shows and stuff like that? When it comes to money, or oh, that's that's a a big uh, big motive. Yeah, it was the same thing. I mean, what they did to me in the World Open in 1976, in I'll give you in the in Toledo in 76, the World Open in 76, the Grand Prix in 76, uh, uh, Gethsemane, Gethsemane, Florida in 78. They tried it in 95 in the Touring Players Classic too, and I got them. <laughs> well. They were trying to give me with the slow ball. I said, go see my wife. They told her, yeah, I got fined $1,200. You know what I told them? Oh, you told my wife? Is she a PBA member? <laughs> I finally got them. There you okay. go. You know, and there were so many things that they did that, that drove me absolutely insane. I... Uh, uh, we were in Alameda, California. I'm in a motorhome. I made, I didn't make the show. I made the finals. I left and I was exhausted and I left Saturday. I drove from Alameda, California, all the way to Vegas. I get to Vegas. That's like 400 and some odd mile. I'm getting off. I'm in my jeans and, and I'm exhausted. Okay. Now, this is when Harry Golden had bypass surgery. Okay. So Ted Hoffman, was the tournament director. He's out in the parking lot looking for somebody for the program and he's trying to get me to ball. I said, Teddy, I ain't bowl. I can't bowl. I just got it. Just told for and he said, you I said, no, I'm not bowling. I said, why are you going into, into, into the casino? What are you out here chasing me? They find me $250. I wouldn't bowl. I said, I ain't bowling. Huh. Huh. You know, but nobody else would do that. Nobody else would, there wasn't anybody on the tour, and I'm telling you, nobody, zero, would stand up for what they believe was right. I didn't care, of course. Okay, I get another. The last story, and I'm out here because I'm getting hungry. <laughs> In 90, when they, when their person became the PBA president, okay, mm -hmm. all right, there was always one nomination. That's right. If there's only one, it, you never lose, right? right? Okay. So I ran for president mm -hmm. as a write-in candidate. Okay. Yeah. And when they do that in the envelope, they put that in the envelope. Okay. Mm -hmm. And at that time was Frank Esposito. All right. So mm -hmm. I ran against Frank Esposito for president. So I wanted to put my uh, what's it, the 
what I was going to do for the PBA in the letter yeah. along with his. And they wouldn't do that. Uh. Cost me $500. <laughs> and I did, well, they figured I wouldn't do it. I said, how much is it going to cost? What's the stamps? And I sent it. Yeah. But here's the bad part. Now, because I paid the money and I did it, they were afraid if he won that they would look bad um, and they manipulated. So they brought me in to count the votes. Hmm. And I should have <laughs> declined it. Yeah. So I'm counting the votes, looking, ripping them open, but I could see who the, it came from. And I don't see good. I'm legally blind. Just to let you know, <laughs> when it comes to reading, well, I don't even need my glasses, okay? <laughs> but I need them for reading. Yeah. And I, wow, that guy was my friend. He voted for Frank. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, I never spoke to him again. <laughs> I was, yeah, but I saw him, and, and and but I saw this one thing. Okay, then I flew from Akron after that to Albany because that's where it was the regional. That's where I was going. All right. And I'm standing there like this. And my buddy, JP, Johnny Petraga, yeah. said, I, it wasn't him. It was another guy with almost the same name, John Peduzzi or something like that. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I almost have ruined my friendship with my best buddy. Oh, John. Oh. <laughs> and so, so now John was infuriated because I, he, he says, there was no way in the world he would ever vote for Frank. Because <laughs> he couldn't stand it. Nobody liked it. I, I, I never, wait, sorry, never supposed to. I'm never supposed to uh, talk bad about the dead. Okay. Yeah. But when they do things that were wrong, okay. So, but get back to that. So he goes there and he said, what's it? And he checked it all out. And he said, no, and he was. So that was squared. So we were. Okay. I'll show you back. When I made the TV show in 1973 in Toledo. Mm -hmm. I used to wear the Carter glove the whole time. The okay. whole time. There was no incentive. So I was practicing with a Weber wristband. Oh. Because it was, I don't know how much it was, 500 bucks or whatever it was to wear it. Mm -hmm. And that was a lot of money. Yeah. You know? And he said, Ernie, he comes up to me and he says, Ernie, how come you? you know, I says, hey, this is 500 bucks. <laughs> And he said, he said, he, and he gave me, he, when I, I'm back, I used to cart a glove. He gave me a check for 500. Not that he sent it to him. The following week or the week after, Jimmy Harahan made the show. And they didn't put it up there. And he did the same thing to him. Well, Timmy turned him in. Huh? That's against PBA regulations for doing that because yeah, nobody liked Frank. They wanted to, and uh, Timmy said they wanted to zap him. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Monday, that was a Saturday. Monday morning, every single guy on the on the Carter staff got fired. Let go. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Okay, so the power structure. Yeah. Bullies. I never feared bullies. You hit him in the head with a bat. Ooh, <laughs> in his head. But that's, well, you're good. You're good. You got to understand. I was five, I'm five ten, 125 pounds when I was in New York, and you're in a population stuff. Yeah. You have to protect yourself. That's right. Well, hey, let's let let's leave it at that. Um, Okay. My, ne my next show is coming up in a week, uh, Tuesday, April 4th. We've got Nick Hogan on. Uh, you Ooh. may remember oh. he was uh, – uh, his name is Nick Hogan. He's from the Twin Cities. He's uh, uh, – Megan Antonelli challenged him to be on the show, and he's making good on that. So, Nick, uh, did he work for the PBA? 
Uh, no, I think you're thinking of Nick Hoglund. <laughs> this is Nick Hogan. <laughs> yeah, Hogan, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, so beat anyway. me, he beat me for a reason. That's why I'm <laughs> like, yo, bum you. You took my money. <laughs> so anyway, a week from tonight, he'll be on. Ernie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate all the stories and all that stuff. If and, they don't uh, get to the, but if the ballers don't understand that the ball and ball is what ruined the game, and I'm not talking about the, uh, the ball. I don't mind about the friction. I do mind about the big giant weight block, the hitting power, okay? I punch yeah. you in the face, and then I put a roll of dimes in there, and I punch it. <laughs> Your kids are okay? And that's what I'm talking about. The yeah. hitting power is just it's just stupid, yeah. okay? And the friction with the power makes everybody stand left and throw right, and I call those bangers, whether with a thumb, without a thumb, they're throwing 20 miles an hour, they're throwing over the gun. That's not bowling. If they went just to, just to friction, up and down, okay. There, I had something that they regulated. The, <laughs> they regulated the softness, yep. okay. They regulated, but they didn't never regulated the weight block. The weight block, okay. <laughs> and how did the Dota ball become legal? And so, yeah. but the yeah. Bellamonte and everybody else. With a thumb, without a thumb, would still be a great ball. Yeah, still be a great ball. But his <laughs> when he's right, his touch, his feel, his speed is phenomenal. Okay. Yep. Okay. Before they changed that rule, he was cheating, and he didn't know he was cheating. And I told, I, I, I accused him of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Yep. Now, if you put your finger well, here, you put your fingers in the ball, and this is where your thumb is. All right, you gotta. All right, now watch this. He could get over here. Yeah. How much side weight does he have? You're only allowed an ounce side weight, and that's what I meant about cheating. Yeah. So that's why I know more about bowling than most ball, and I'm the only guy that could see that. You know. All right. You know, well, hey. Yeah. You know, so there. <laughs> if they get, if they could get a union to understand, this is an eight. Uh, the 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 PBA is owned by an eight billion dollar company. Okay. Oh, I, oh, I missed something. Oh, shit. oh my. Oh, I missed something. No, oh, where the hell is it? Where the hell is it? Oh man. Oh, I missed something. Well, I tell you what. You email me what what you missed, and and I'll get it out to our Facebook group, and and we'll catch up that way. All right. Faster, faster. Well, where the hell is it? <laughs> Okay, I believe. Okay, I believe that we should have six arenas all around, all around the nation. Yeah. Okay, and you start with Detroit because it's the number, it's the, the bowling capital of the world. Okay, and with that, you have how do you how do you build them? How do you build the regionals? I mean, how do you build them? How do you build them? You IPO. Okay, remember I told you about the AMF? Yeah. They got an IPO with, and people bought stock in that mm -hmm. company. Okay? And when they bought stock, it became a $300 million corporation. Whew. Okay, so now you have AMF Bolero. Okay? But I would want them to LLC it, separate it from their company, which is all the bowling centers, and have an LLC, and you, build, and you, uh, and you IPO it, for all each of these arenas, okay? okay, and that's why they built the one in Reno. That's why uh, Mike Maniac built that one on South Point to bring the ABC and all these bowlers in there. You know, you, I don't know how many teams and the amount of money it brings to the town. So if they brought them in six regions, you could have all all the organizations they said if you looked at, i looked up and they don't have it i looked up how many organizations are there in the united states they don't have it you know what the nisi league is nisi is everybody is japanese it's huge around the united states and then you have the uh, uh the national i think it's a the black associate tons of them and then you have the military uh the then you have the USBC, the Nationals. You could bring back the classic team. Uh, yeah. Then you could have the, the singles from January to 
to May, and then you have team teams in there, and you can shut down in the summer. Yeah. And uh, and then you can have them a World Series of all the people in it to one time. If they don't believe me, tough break. <laughs> I don't care. I'm doing well. I'm retired. I, I uh, I'm I'm going to eat. And I'm happy, <laughs> and I'm still alive. There you go. Uh, all right. But, but to all all professional bowlers, if you any if you are listening to me now, you go to Chris Barnes and you try to make him the head of the union. Okay, if he is the head of the union, uh, uh, you you try to get somebody that knows how to make it happen. Everyone says you need a lawyer. Well, uh, that uh, is Roger Goodell uh, or the guy that's the head of the football. Is he the lawyer? I, I guess they are. But <laughs> without a union, you're going to be bowling for peanuts uh, <laughs> all the time. And all yeah, the time. It's just, just, just no other way. Okay. <laughs> but right now, with the PBA being for profit, this plan that I showed you with six in. Oh, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> you see here? You can't even get it. Put me on just to by itself, just a quick like, sec. Like that. <laughs> okay. And you see that? Yeah. That round thing. That's the, that's the arena. Uh. Okay. You see a round? You see I, I think it's in a lot of pies? Yeah. Okay. That's where you have head to head matches. You see the skinny round thing? Yep. Okay. That's where the the uh the sweets are. Ah. Uh. Okay. And they watch balling from there and they can gamble from there. And they uh. eat from there. That's where okay. all arenas are. You ever been to Baltimore? That the uh, what's the, the every single one of them is beautiful. I went to Safeco Field, I don't know what it's called now, but it's phenomenal. <laughs> They got all the, all the, all the, uh, what do they call them? The sweets, uh, the Dallas, it's a billion dollars. The, 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 uh, stadiums cost a billion dollars. All right. We'd I'll tell you them. what, I'll tell you what, over what, a billion. You, you got to eat and I got to go. So we're going <laughs> to, <gonna, laughs> I tell you, I was you, bought with a, a phonograph needle. I'm sorry, but my uh, passion is for bowlers to understand. Yeah. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you again next week. See you again. Bye-bye. <laughs>